You are watching Excess LaPorte County, Channel 97. Coming up next is the October 15th, 2024 meeting of the Michigan City Common Council. You can find more information for this meeting by visiting www.accesslaportcounty.org. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the October 15th Michigan City City Council meeting to order. If you would, please silence all electronic devices, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and a moment of silent prayer. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Nylum, on the roll call, please. Mr. Beatry? Present. Mr. Coulter? Present. Mr. Dabney? Present. Dr. Cora? Present. Ms. Lee? Present. Ms. Moldenauer? Present. Mr. Nelson? Present. Mr. Prezbolinski? Present. And Ms. Tillman? Present. We have nine present and no one absent. Thank you, Ms. Nylum. And just for general information uh, to my council uh, colleagues, uh, when you're trying to address me, maybe speak a little louder because I got a uh, plugged left ear. Okay, so I appreciate that. And uh, folks in the public, you know, if this is your chance, you want to yell at me, you're more than welcome to come up to the speaker and yell at me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, moving along, uh, approval of the uh, minutes from the October 1st meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Motion to approve by Dr. Cora, and I think it was seconded by Councilman Tracy Thanks. Tillman. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Reports of any standing committees. Reports of any standing committees. Dr. Cora. Mr. President, uh, the uh, the Health and uh, Safety Committee, we met many uh, of the uh, our colleagues on the council participated. Uh, this was held at the uh, uh, police headquarters, uh, and uh, we had nice participation discussion about parking-related problems. We will continue to work on that, and uh, uh, we're going to reconvene in a few months. We gave some ideas as to what we need to work on, and uh, we'll reconvene, and then hopefully we'll come up with a plan by then. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. Any other council members? Thank you. Uh, Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. The Michigan City Riverboat, the Michigan City Finance Committee did not meet on this evening due to um, prior meetings that would have ran over. Starting off with the Michigan City Riverboat Board, Claims docket for October 15th, 2024. Riverboat. I'm sorry. Fund number 2235, $188,925. Riverboat EFT, $0. Boy Development. Fund number 2504, $200,000. Total claims, $388,925. The $188,925 was for Midwest Golf and Turf. And the $200,000 was for Michigan City Economic Development. Again, totaling claims for $388,925. The City of Michigan City 2024 Riverboat Fund Statement of Cash Position, Fiscal Year to Date, October 31st, 2024, Ending Balance, $3,113,733.86. Yeah. Yours don't show that. Mine's different. Right, they did a revised. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so, with that being said, let's see what we're at. 
Is there a motion to uh, approve the claims? So moved. Support. There's been a motion by Councilman Cora and seconded by Councilman Dabney. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Claims are uh, approved. Reports from any boards and commissions. Reports from any boards or commissions. Reports of special or select committees. Reports from the mayor, other office of Michigan City officers and departments. And Ms. Nyla, if you would, by title only, our first petition before us this evening. A petition P-102-24, rezoning R1D to B2-230 at 2308 Franklin Street, Bacon Lot, facing South Street, situated beside 1701 Lafayette Street, Parcel number 46-01-36-124-022-46-0133-164-0001-0000-022 Michigan City, Indiana. Thank you, Ms. Silo. Yeah. Yeah, and with that petition before us, is there anyone here to speak on the petition? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, how are you? Name and address for the record, please, sir. The My name is George Diaz, and the address is 2308 Franklin Street, and there, that one, and there's a lot behind it, an empty lot situated right next to 1701 Lafayette Street mm -hmm. and facing South Street. Okay, and Gail, do you need the gentleman's home address or the business address, okay? The business address is all right, thank you. Okay. My personal address is 110 Woodside Drive. <laughs> I just want to make important. sure the records are kept straight, that's all, thank you. Go ahead, sir. So I'm just here to see if I can get her approved. One of the, the 2308, uh, zone from B uh, from R1D to B2. That's half of my building. So it's I've been doing business there for I've been doing business in Michigan City for over 42 years, and I I owned that lot for over 30 years. And it was A uh, and W root beer or um, before that for mm -hmm. X amount of years. So I'm not sure what happened there. And the lot besides that. I need it for uh, like a parking lot because people coming off of Franklin Street sometimes it gets difficult to pull into the lot. So people park there. So I need to move the cars from there and put them in the parking lot right next door on that empty lot. So I would like to resolve that one to be too. Okay. Are there any uh, questions by the council members? Of the petitioner. Yeah, Councilman Dietrich. Uh, I know this is coming up to us later on in this meeting as a, as a, an ordinance on first reading, but it, this is for uh, mainly for parking, is it? Correct. Not? Okay. The one the one is already a, a shop which has been my shop for a long time, but somehow it got zoned residential. Okay. Half of the shop. Okay. Yeah, they have visible. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, George, you look great. <laughs> I'm Skyler, director of planning. So, so the issue here is that he has a building and it was half and half zoned. It's two parcels, but the parcels were half and half zoned. One was zoned B2, one was zoned R1D. So mm -hmm. it would hinder him if, say, say that building burnt down, he wouldn't be able to, it would be really hard for him to build that back. So as part of our review, when he came to us and wanted to build a parking lot, we said, hey, you really should consider rezoning this because it, it could hurt your business later on. If something was to happen, you want to mm -hmm. expand your business. And he was doing this to basically move cars off of Franklin to the back where he can store and it could be secured. So it's actually going to clean up the front of that building. And I think that's what Mr. Zavius would like to do um, with that. So it made sense. And we've dealt with a few of these. I don't think the previous uh, zoning 
um, whenever it was done in 2010, took into consideration that granular like parcel data. And they just basically looked at anything lining Franklin. Well, his is two parcels and two parcels deep. So that's hence why we're here today. And it, it passed through Planning Commission with a positive recommendation because we've dealt with a few of these. Sorry. Okay. I appreciate it. No, I Thank want to. <laughs> Sorry for not being that clear. No, <laughs> Coming yeah. out an excellent job. <laughs> yeah. Any other uh, questions from the council members? Thank you, sir. Thank yep. you. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this uh, petition? Hello. Hello, board. Scott Nolan, Turn Kind of Place. I attended both Board of Works meetings where this matter has already, I think, with unanimous uh, vote, uh, been approved or recommended for approval. This is a Apex Auto. He's a long term good neighbor in Michigan City. And his actual building is on two lots. The one on Franklin is commercial. If you saw if you saw a beacon thing, it would make more sense. Um, but the back half of his building is the lot he's talking about now. So it, it's been a commercial. It's been commercial for 40 years. And then he has a vacant residential lot be, behind that that he's asking to make a parking lot. So it makes nothing but good sense here. It's a vacant residential lot, but nobody's going to want to build a house there at this time with, you know, a, an auto repair shop next as your neighbor pretty much and again the board of works was i believe unanimous in its recommendation to approve this and just this member of the public also thinks you should approve it thank you okay yep. thank you the question oh yeah tommy clover 1316 ohio street this all came down from the planning commission was unanimously approved so mr zayas can park his customer vehicles on this residential lot so it can be rezoned he can continue to serve the public with his business thank you Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Paul Prisbowski, 1716 Washington Street. George and his uh, family have been running that business, and they've been a, a good and friendly service for the community. And uh, I believe as being in that area, <clears throat> he, uh, knowing him and going to the business for service, I believe that <clears throat> you need to approve it and move forward. Thank you. Anyone else from the public who should speak on this petition? Anyone else from the public who should speak on this petition? Having none, public comment is now closed. Councilman Dabney. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming up and and uh, clearing this all up. This is coming to say as an ordinance on first reading, uh, but just like everybody explained, it's just going to be cleaning up the front the business there to move cars to be able to park in the back and take them off franklin street um and that was passed down from the planning commission with a unanimous uh um approval um moving forward so when it comes up in, as an ordinance i won't have to mention anything it's been covered well by the public here yeah and when i started uh investigating this and and what it was all about yeah, i mean to approve this is only makes sense uh to have a building where half of it's zoned r1 and the other half is zoned b2 i didn't even know that those kind of things existed so yeah uh to my to myself i'll be voting to uh to approve this uh, any further comments by the council any further comments is there a motion to approve the petition so moved support okay councilman uh Cora. Uh, made a motion and seconded by Councilman Dabney on the vote, Ms. Nyla. Ms. Moldenauer? Aye. Mr. Nelson? Aye. Mr. Presbolinski? Aye. Ms. Tillman? Aye. Mr. Beatry? Aye. Mr. Coulter? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Dr. Cora? Aye. And Ms. Lee? Aye. There's nine in favor and no one opposed. Okay. The petition has been passed, and we'll wait for the ordinance to come up. Uh, Ms. Nyla, our first resolution by title only. Um, we need to do uh, communication. Oh, I'm sorry. Communications, Ms. Nyla. Correspondence was received on September 27th from Mr. Rodney McCormick regarding Housing Authority. Correspondence was also received on October 2nd 
from Kamisha Williams regarding a four-way stop. Okay, thank you, Ms. Nyla. Now, our first resolution by title only. A resolution by title only, recognition of the concerns of residents of Silver Birch and their request for assistance for the Michigan City Common Council and appeal to the Family and Social Services Administration, FSSA. And this is introduced by Dr. Cora, Ms. Moldenauer, and Mr. Don Prezbolinski. And do the authors have anything they'd like to add at this time? Ms. President. Councilman Cora. Yeah, you know, this uh, matter came up about a month ago, a, a little over a month ago, uh, when it was brought to our attention uh, that uh, Silver Birch, which is one of the assisted living facilities, uh, there was some change um, in how FSSA was handling um, uh, admissions to Silver Birch. Um, and because of um, because of that, uh, there were concerns that new uh, new uh, residents who needed to go to Silver Birch uh, would have a long waiting period, mm -hmm. and then also individuals who are residents there and who end up going to the hospital or uh, rehab uh, for whatever reason, and then if they were to go back to Silver Birch, um, then they probably would also have a long waiting period, and this would put these individuals in a difficult situation. Uh, so we had a meeting with the administration at Silver Birch, and uh, many of uh, our colleagues from the council uh, came to that meeting, uh, and then we had conversations with our state representative, Pat Boy, uh, State Senator Michael Bohacek, and State Senator Rodney Pohl. And um, so there is a problem. This has been brought to the attention of FSSA. Uh, and the reason we are bringing this resolution uh, is to express our support um, uh, to the residents of Silver Birch and their families uh, to look into this matter so that this waiting period, the long waiting period can be avoided. That way uh, they can continue to have uh, the services uh, delivered at Silver Birch. Yeah, and doctor, do you have any idea of where this issue stands? So this has been brought up. So our state legis, uh, both the state representative Pat Boy and state senator, they have brought it to the attention of FSSA, and the FSSA initially said that this will not impact um, the residents, and they had enough slots allocated, but. Uh, from what we hear from the residents and the administration at Silver Birch, that is not true. So that matter is still being discussed. And I think by passing this resolution, forwarding it to the FSSA, and maybe a, a copy to the governor's office, I think it, we can bring uh, this to, to the attention of the authorities who are making these decisions. Okay. And uh, Madam Clerk, uh, that's what I'm going to recommend is that we have a copy of this resolution sent to the FS, FSSA and also the uh, governor's office. And one thing I would like to say, uh, Dr. Cora, I want to thank you for your uh, leadership on this issue and setting the, meet the meeting up with Silver Birch and also uh, working with our council attorney to get the resolution put together and get it in front of us. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, moving forward, are there any other comments from the council sponsors? I don't have any. Do you have any, Councilwoman? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this resolution? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this resolution? Having none, uh, any council comments? Any council comments? Motion Councilwoman to Tillman. Motion to approve. Support. Motion to approve by Councilwoman Tillman and seconded by Councilman Dabney. Yeah. Oh, Councilman Beatry. Okay, Ms. Nyla, on the vote, please. Mr. Nelson. Aye. Mr. Krasbolinski. Aye. Ms. Tillman. Aye. Mr. Beatry. Aye. Mr. Coulter. Aye. Mr. Dabney. Aye. Dr. Cora. Aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. And Ms. Moldenauer. Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Nyla. Our next resolution by title only. 
Ms. Nyla? A resolution by title only, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of Michigan City, Indiana, approving the issuance of tax inc increment revenue bonds of the redevelopment district of the city for purpose of providing funds for the cost of certain local public improvements that support residential housing development and all matters related thereto. And this is introduced by Ms. Tillman. And does the author have anything she'd like to add? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, just to start off by saying that this was being on the redevelopment as the liaison, that this was something that was approved during that time to bring forth before the council. And I believe we do have um, Mr. York or attorney Sirnick here that could speak more in depth in regards to this resolution, if you would, please. Good afternoon, uh, Director. I'm, I'm Scott York. I'm the Director in uh, Planning and Redevelopment. Uh, tonight with us, we have Mr. Uh, Attorney Randolph Rampola, Attorney Alan Saranek, and we also have online Andrew Mauser, and they're going to go over this project with you. Um, this is a residential infrastructure project that we received from the Indiana Finance Authority to build basically the bypass that we've been talking about, the Lake Avenue lift station bypass, um, which is very much needed uh, and it needs to happen sooner than later um, but this is would be a, a, a partnership with the sanitary district and i'm going to let alan jump in on that and kind of explain the partnership and go with that okay good evening i'm uh, randy rompolo with uh, barnes and thornburg with offices in south bend indiana and we are serving as bond counsel for the proposed financing the resolution before you would approve and authorize uh, bonds to be issued by the Redevelopment Commission uh, to evidence the loan that Skylar spoke of. Um, the bonds would be issued an amount not to exceed $4.8 million. Um, Alan had handed out kind of a, a FAQ on not only the loan and, and the project a little bit, but also the tax increment, the mechanism of tax increment, because these bonds would be payable solely from tax increment revenues. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But just to step back, so uh, Skylar mentioned the Indiana Finance Authority Residential Housing Infrastructure Program. The General Assembly last year, um, uh, recognizing the housing needs in the state provided for this program to be created and, and partially funded by the state so that the Indiana Finance Authority could provide low interest loans to communities to undertake projects that would increase the possibility of new housing construction in their communities. And so uh, Michigan City applied for that and the IFA has granted Michigan City an award to do a low interest loan to be able to fund these sewer improvements, which ultimately will lead to the prospect of new housing being able to be developed as a result of these sewer improvements. Um, the, to evidence the loan, the IFA does require the loan be paid back. It's not a, it's not a, a, a forgivable loan, if you will. Um, sometimes you may talk about the IFA does a lot of sewer utility work, and sometimes those loans can be forgivable because of the federal program. This does have to be paid back. And so it would be evidenced and paid back by a TIF revenue bond issue that would be issued by the Redevelopment Commission. The IFA ultimately would be the purchaser of the bonds, and those bonds would be payable then solely from the tax increment revenues that would be expected to be collected from the consolidated north and south TIF area. Um, the bond terms under the IFA program are better than what the uh, Redevelopment Commission or the city could achieve out in the marketplace. Because these bonds are payable solely from the TIF revenues, the interest rates in the market would probably be north of, well, be somewhere between four and a half and 6% likely. Uh, the IFA program uh, has quoted a rate to the city at this point of 2.43%. Um, yes, 2.43%. So it would be significantly below market. Additionally, uh, the IFA will not require a debt service reserve fund, which would be several hundred thousand dollars that would either have to be funded from cash by the Redevelopment Commission or funded out of the bond proceeds, reducing the amount of money that would be available for the project. So that's just another savings by going to the IFA as opposed to going into the market. The last thing I would mention, and those of you who have been on the council will know in the past, the Redevelopment Commission has worked with the Redevelopment Authority to do tax-backed lease financings. So those financings are sold to the market 
payable from the TIF revenues, but to be able to get the lowest rate in the market, the city and the, I'm sorry, the redevelopment district had, has pledged a tax backup. That's not required here. These bonds would be payable solely from the tax increment revenues. Again, that would be generated in the consolidated north and south TIF areas. And the, the, the handout goes through kind of the TIF mechanism, just to be clear. The TIF itself is not a tax. All it is is a capturing of the taxes that are paid with respect to increased assessed values in the allocation area. So if you look at the chart there, you can kind of see, um, I think it's on the second page of the frequently asked questions at the top, but it's the, it's the incremental assessed value in this little triangle. That's, that's where the Redevelopment Commission can capture that under the redevelopment statute and use those revenues for local public improvements in the allocation areas, which would include these types of improvements that would be funded by this IFA loan. So the resolution before you authorizes and approves the commission issuing bonds of up to 4.8 million, which is at the expected principal amount. It has a 20 year term as a parameter and it has a not to exceed 4% interest rate. We know the interest rate likely will be somewhere around 2.43%. That's what they've quoted thus far. Certainly it will be well below three, but just again, to be able to get the approvals in place so we don't have to come back in the event the interest rate crept up a little, um, we asked for not to exceed. Same with the term. We're anticipating the term will be 16 years, but we asked for in the resolution not to exceed 20 years. And that's certainly the Redevelopment Commission's approvals had those same terms as well. Um, so I think with that, um, oh, I should say, and Andy Mauser is online, but Baker Tilly, the Redevelopment Commission's municipal advisor, has looked at the TIF revenues. There are certainly sufficient TIF revenues not only to pay this back, but also continue to fund all of the other obligations of the Redevelopment Commission with respect to the TIF. And I should say, all of the TIF from the north and south would be pledged to pay this debt back, excepting the station block project. You may recall that's the most recent financing that the city incented the developer to build the station block, providing some financing and pledging the TIF revenues that will be generated from that particular project. So that will be accepted from the pledge to pay these bonds back. And again, uh, if you have questions, Andy's online, but he he and his shop has confirmed that there are sufficient TIF revenues to pay this debt as well as the uh, other obligations of the city. Um, so I think with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know if I've missed anything, Alan, can uh, fill in, but thank you. Alan Saranac, I'm the attorney for the Redevelopment Commission. Uh, just to add two other things to what Randy was just saying, in talking with Andy Mauser, by doing a bond this way, and then a bond is really, I mean, that's the correct term, but it really, it's more like a loan. But by doing it this way, we estimate minimally saving at least $900,000 by doing this process as opposed to doing a more traditional bond. The second thing um, is that, you know, we, we have these conversations in years past with respect to what is the purpose of the Redevelopment Commission, and more importantly, what is the purpose of the TIF? and the increment that gets uh, generated from assessed valuation because of improvements made within a TIF district. And I, I, Skylar and I talked about when we worked on this project, this is the perfect example of what, of what a TIF is all about. There's been increased assessed valuation, there's been an increment that's been generated, now we identified both an immediate need as it relates to sewage improvements, but also the need for future development in the city. And by having future development in the city, we will continue to have increased assessed valuation and continue to have generate more increment so that we can continue to do projects. But this is a classic example and a perfect example of exactly what a TIF is to be used for by municipalities and the tool it has and the tool it creates for redevelopment efforts and generating interest in redevelopment throughout a municipality. My two cents. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Andy Mauser? Yeah, I have a few questions, Dr. Mr. Moore. President. Yeah. First of all, um, the interest of 2.43, is that, is that a fixed interest rate for the duration of the term? It is, yes. Okay. It is intended to be, again, through the IFA program, it's well below market. So it's intended, right, right. but it is a fixed interest it's rate. Right. The other question I had was, um, you said incremental assessed value. Is the increment in the assessed value because of the increase 
uh, in the property values of the existing properties in that TIF, or is it from the growth of new uh, developments in the TIF? It can be both. It can be both. So it can okay. be new development happening in the area so that where there was bare ground and minimal assessment, the incremental value of that new development will generate tax increment, but also the growth of the assessed value can generate TIF. But I will say, and Andy can correct me, but there is a mechanism that the DLGF, the Department of Local Government Finance, will use so that it isn't just simply increases in assessed value, creating more TIF. They they do a, a rebalancing of the TIF, if you will. So just normal increases of AV will be offset by the DLGF calculations. Okay. And the last question I had was for Mr. York. Um, and what is this money going to be used for? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm probably going to slaughter this, Dr. Cora. Uh, I, the, I wish I had uh, had the sanitary district here, but I'm going to try to summarize this. Um, what What's happening is there is um, the the north side of 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 twelve uh, is all fed by basically it all all the sewer flows down and it comes all the way down to the marina uh, B and E lift station and it's causing um, overflowing there. It's been doing it for a while now. And it's because of the development, the demand of development that's happening. Uh, we're getting new houses built. They're connecting. It's just causing more, there's, le there's less capacity in the lines and it's causing it to overflow more frequently. So what this will do, um, and in fact, we've been working to acquire land. Uh, we have acquired the old, I think it's called the Nickel Plate Railroad. Uh, that right away where Peanut Bridge is, and then we acquired the north side of the of the railroad as well. Just recently, we did that with um, a partnership with Anacosta Railroad. We're able now to use that right away to run our brand new sewer ladder, lateral. Well, new new sewer. Um, we'll put a lift station north of twelve. Uh, basically, if you know where Burnham Brewery is, it's going to go north right there. There's a right of way, the old railroad. You'll see a lift station go there, and then we will go underneath the railroad and we'll go straight to the district. So it's actually a perfect example of um, working partnership with the sanitation district to create this bypass, if you will, and, and prevent this overflowing that then ends up in our river and creek and everything else. But also it's a good partnership with respect to the Redevelopment Commission with we have the land we've been preparing the land it's a good use of this land to to use it for this uh, bypass sewer on top of that as part of this project we're also able to get in a service road that will hopefully be used as a part of the, an extension of the trail the peanut trail as well so that's another piece the last that. question is because of this uh, uh it'll improve increase the capacity so where can the housing be developed the new house so up north of 12 we estimate there's about 200 vacant lots that can be developed there's also um you may recall the blank building which is right across the the right across the river here that couldn't be developed right now on the sanitation that exists right now because there's no capacity but now that we own the right of way all the way to center street we're thinking we could and we're going to size this uh, lift station to be to absorb more capacity so what you're seeing today it's going to be sized to hold more so we'll be able to come right down that right of way when blank when the blank building does develop um, there's some other vacant land up there um, we're thinking there's 90 acres uh, right where um, the Woodruff property if that ever developed that's been programmed into our comprehensive plan to be developed it's just building that capacity so there's 200 vacant lots in estimation that could be have new houses on them without this process or without this um, overflow we wouldn't be able we're kind of running into a dire situation where um, we don't want to get into a moratorium situation with development of houses. That's just thank simple. you very much. Hope I answered that. Hey, on Councilman Dabney. And I'm just asking this question. I'm sure you can probably explain it better than me in terms of just bonding authority. I think this is our first one with this, this yeah. council in terms of having to do bonding or issue. Please explain the, the bonding authority and where that comes from in the city. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm going to have Randy take that one. Um, uh, where does it come from? Um, again, the bond is the mechanism. That's how Randy explained it to me. The bond is the mechanism to allow us to pay this loan back. Right. So it's a little bit different than the traditional bond that we did for the train station. That was a, 
a, a city a city that was something we did to create a development right now we're getting a loan and we have to create this bond to pay it back so with that i'm gonna let randy jump sure. in and explain a little bit more so i'll be more simple than that. <laughs> yeah yeah no, I mean, essentially, the civil city has its own bonding capacity and authorities. You can issue the city, you can issue general obligation bond, you can issue different types of utility bonds, different types of revenue bonds. So under the redevelopment statute, the Redevelopment Commission can issue bonds payable from TIF revenues or a property tax levy or a combination of both. And I, I was on my way over here, I was reminding myself that the city of Michigan City a long time ago, uh, frankly, before I was practicing, um, was issued a, a pure TIF revenue bond, and that was paid off. Um, and since then, to be able to get the best interest rate in the market, you've been issuing these tax-backed bonds. And that's what, for some of you who've been on the council or been uh, keeping up to date with things that the city has done, you've done a number of those tax-backed TIF bonds um, those are great to sell to the market because you pay them back with these tax increment finance revenues, but you put a tax back up in place. And it's it's essentially like having, uh, uh, when you go to the bank and get and ask for a loan and they tell you what your interest rate is, the better, the more security you have, the better interest rates or better terms they'll give you. And so you've done a lot of that to be able to go out into the market and sell bonds. And those bonds are being issued through the Redevelopment Commission and the Redevelopment Authority. This bond is a pure tax increment revenue bond. So in a sense, it's sort of going back to the past because that's essentially where Michigan City started back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, when you created the very first TIF area in Michigan City. Um, this bond, it is to evidence the loan to the IFA. Um, as I said, it's not a forgivable loan. Sometimes the state does that, but this program is meant to pay for itself so that the IFA can continue to loan money out. So they'll loan, the state funded it with seed money, but the intent is to make these loans to communities have the communities pay them back with a small interest rate, and then the IFA will continue to loan the money out into the future. So this loan will be payable solely from the rede rede redevelopment's tax increment revenues. And that's why we wanted to give you that little FAQ on tax increment. I'm happy to talk more about tax increment, but again, tax increment is not a tax levy. All it is is a temporary reallocation of taxes attributable to increases in assessed value. Um, and those go to the Redevelopment Commission to be able to do these types of projects, as Alan indicated. So you're trying to improve the city by doing development that'll lead to future development. And that, in essence, was the station block, if you think to that. Um, the idea of building the station block and incenting the developer to do that and provide that tax-backed bond incentive to that developer using TIF revenues the intent is so that it'll lead to more development in the city, increases in assessed value that'll benefit all of the overlapping taxing units eventually. Uh, so this bond is a redevelopment bond payable solely from TIF to the IFA. The IFA is the bond buyer and the bond holder during the term of the bond. Uh, so I don't know if I've covered enough, but okay. Uh, this is not related to what not following up what Randy talked about time frames. We're looking to get this closed or get the bond closed by the, the end of December. end of end of December, middle of December, and a lot of things have to happen. I've been working with the sanitary district to lay out the timeline for bidding, which they have approved. If I'm not I'm looking at Julie, yeah, yeah. it's been approved. Um, I've also been working with Tim Warner. Me and Tim Warner have been working closely with uh, Thate GLE, who's doing all the survey work and the uh, engineering for this. And I believe we're getting very near having a, a bond or uh, a bidding document really soon. So we're kind of all moving along t in tandem uh, all in, in, with this project. So that's just giving you a time frame. And then we look probably to bid out yet this year and build early spring, I'm thinking. So that just gives you kind of a timeline. I, well, maybe just yeah, just to put a, a finer point on it, the intent of closing in December is that bids are expected to be received in November, so we'll know exactly the amount that needs to be borrowed. And we think it'll be close to four point eight million, just based on the engineer estimates, but it could be a little bit less. But given the approval we're asking for, it won't be any more. But we wouldn't close on the bonds until after the bids are received. We know exactly what the cost of the project is. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other Councilman Beatry? I know there's um, a grand plan out there with the Redevelopment Authority or the Redevelopment Commission to to plan development in Michigan City and around Michigan City. And I know that funding those projects, the bigger they are, well, even the small projects are, it takes a lot of money to get those done. And you have to, you have to find the right pro, uh, partners as well. I guess in, in my own mind, I'm wondering, I like this idea. I like it a lot that it's not backed up with taxes, that it's all TIF. But as we approve projects like this, do these projects imperil us in any way in the future as future development opportunities come along? So I can give a higher view and then Skylar maybe can speak to specifics, but from a, uh, and Andy's online, he can jump in too, but from a, uh, from a financing perspective, some of the new projects that may happen may need incentives, right? And again, thinking back to the station block, the developer, you know, would, indicated that this is what they needed to make that project happen. But if you think about it, the station block, the development they're putting in is essentially in large part going to be funded by that development. And so in a lot of communities we work in, that's essentially where the rubber's meeting the road so that if you have a developer that's willing to build housing, you can do residential TIF now or build apartments or townhomes, that project will essentially pay for itself. So you can create separate allocation areas that will you will be able to provide incentives that will fund that project. So that's one piece of it. The other piece is, and again, just based on the calculations that Baker Tilly has run, given the small amount of this bond, and, and four point eight million doesn't sound small, but in the grand scheme of all of the available funds, it's a smaller number coupled with the term of 16 years and coupled with the lower interest rate, it still leaves with significant room to be able to do an area-wide project or other projects that may not generate the TIF, right? This project itself won't generate increment, but it's, it may lead or hopefully will lead to additional development down the road that'll, mm -hmm. in, that'll provide new assessed value. So there's still the ability using this amount of increment for this project, it still leaves money on the table, not only to fund pay-as-you-go projects on an annual basis, but to also do other larger projects that may have to be financed down the road, but still leaves the door open for those projects where they could be funded with TIF from that project itself. I might, I might have, I, I might have Mr. Mauser jump in and kind of explain. Um, we were, uh, me and him talk a lot. Um, we uh, we were very cautious about this because we didn't we don't want to harm any future incentives that we may need to give to to provide right whether it's infrastructure or direct financing whatever. Um, but I'm gonna have Andy kind of jump in and kind of explain um, the percentages. I think that might be something interesting. Or Andy, you heard the question. I'm just gonna let you kind of take it away. Yeah, thank you, Skyler. Um, Good evening, council members. Again, Andy Mauser with Baker Tilly. We serve as financial advisor to the Redevelopment Commission. Um, I think what's exciting about you know this project, Station Block, um, and others is it's um, you know really the Redevelopment Commission and the city starting to kind of reinvest um, in future growth. Um, we are at a point where we're you know four or five years away from some of the first um, TIF expirations that will start to occur. Um, so much of the assessed value that's currently captured um, by the TIF areas um, will start to go back to the tax base um, as early as 2029. Um, and then the, there will be um, additional expirations that will occur throughout the 2030s. Um, so projects like this start to open up um, you know, additional development um, that will start to replenish um, the TIF areas at the same time that um, existing TIF starts to be returned to the tax base. Um, so I think it's important, um, you know, to, to kind of continually um, reinvest um, in projects that are going to drive um, future growth. Um, for the next few years, the Redevelopment Commission has very, very strong um, TIF coverage. Um, we're really looking at, you know, anywhere from 150 to well over well over 200 percent coverage over the next four to five year period. Um, and then in the, the late 2029, you know, late 2020s mm -hmm. into the 2030s, that coverage will drop down a little bit. Um, but, you know, the idea is here in the next few years, um, a lot of the 
um, new um, development that's going to occur as a result of a lot of these infrastructure improvements, like I said, will start to kind of replenish what will be lost here in the next few years. Thank you, Andy. Can I just one more thing? Yeah. I believe what Mr. Dabney was getting at, though, is that we do not have the authority to bond for new members. We, you provide, the council provides the authority to bond to the Redevelopment Commission. We bond through you guys with your support. That's all I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the information. Appreciate okay. it. All right. Any other, uh, any other comments from the public? Ernie Hallahan, 302 Gladys Street. I'm just wondering, uh, you've been trying to get funds for all the property that you annexed, and that hasn't been put through even yet for sewer and, and other things. That was brought up quite a few meetings ago, and I haven't heard any more about it. Is that put back on hold, or is it? I don't know exactly where that's at, but we're not, yeah, this isn't give and take right now, Ernie. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Paul Przewalinski, 1716 Washington Street. I uh, would like to know if this sewer project is going to separate the sewers and the uh, depth of what's going to happen out there for future development, <clears throat> because in that whole area, in the Canada area, and they're having some lots cleared, if it's going to take in Shoreland Hills and expand that, how much capacity for that amount of money <clears throat> is it going to expand the uh, district? Because when you separate sewers, you expand, <clears throat> excuse me, the capacity of the sanitary district. Is that going to have any effect with this project? <clears throat> I guess uh, I guess if the sanitary district was here, they could answer it. Yeah, it, it, the answer is yes. I, I don't know to what extent. That's that's a, that's probably a John Cranky, uh, the initial engineer that's working on it. But we have talked about the uh, there are some um, combined sewers in that area, and we did have a discussion about that. So the answer is yes. I just don't want to speak for the sanitary just because I don't know the specifics on that. Okay, uh, I want to make one more point: is that you know th this. The sanitary district should be here or have some have somebody here to explain the details of the plan. Now, I can understand the financing in that. I don't think the general public can. But I think they would be able to grasp it more if they were here talking about the, the expansion of that. And does anybody know if there's been any overflows that involve raw sewage? It is, you know, I, I know where the, I, I know where the uh, station is on by B and E, and I mean I didn't, I'm not running down there because I think we should be able to get those questions at a meet at a public meeting. That's a that's a darn shame, but I'm not saying I'm against anything that you can use the Real redevelopment commission for, because then in turn. The ratepayers, the sanitary district doesn't have to do a bond. Okay. And then also, I just want to remind the council because probably some people don't know that we have an $8 million tunnel in the ground that's not being used that should be used to expand a project called Lafayette Barker Sewer Combination and Separation. So, I'm putting that out there as food for thought in the future. Thank you. Well, it's kind of 200 kind of the place. I've attended previous meetings. I think the Board of Works or the Redevelopment Commission where this matter was discussed. My understanding as a layperson is roughly at the Swing Bridge, the area where Skylar's saying they want to put the lift station in. We currently have three sewer lines meeting altogether. This is going to this lift station will separate them relieving an overload the, the sanitary commission has reported they have an alarm they call it the b and e alarm there's a manhole on the b and e property 
They get alarms when the water rises in there, meaning the sewers, the capacity and backing up. They've identified that as a major problem for them. They get the alarmed, they get alarmed quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, this project is meant to alleviate that problem and we've acquired the necessary land to do the direct line to the water treatment plant. This also provides capacity to the east of Trail Creek for the development as Schuyler laid out, opening up for future development. That's the need for it. To me, there's no negative about this. The financing is unique. It's a new program in Indiana. It's below market rate. It's intergovernmental and it's made just for this. Uh, and time is of the essence. This needs to be closed before the end of the year, which effectively means December 15th or 20th. Um, I would encourage you to move forward with this. With the meetings I've attended, it, it makes all the sense in the world and I see no negatives about it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes, Tommy Kolovic, 1360 Noah. It's like Scott and Mr. Rampola said, I strongly encourage this to be moved forward and, and pushed through. I know in the, the future development, I know we're going to, Mayor Angie, the little birdie told me that we're going to have a major workforce development going in in that area. So, you know, there's got to be a hand all the sewer and water for that. And I just want, well, you really need to pass this. Thank you. All right, just one more thing. Um, we we do, so the Lafayette Barker, that's another big project. We, we are aware of that, and I know that I've spoken to the mayor about that. That is a priority for the mayor to try to find if that, if there is a function to that. We might recall the Redevelopment Commission funded a study for that. We proved that we can use that, so we will be looking for funds to do that. And I might just add that um, this is the first round of the IFA, and we were one of the first, we were one of the first communities selected to do this. So we're kind of cutting, well, probably one of the first ones is going to get it in place. Um, and we received one of the largest grants from the IFA as well, or I'm sorry, not grants, loans. Um, there will be another round of this, uh, from what I'm told, and that might be this. So hopefully we can go after some more later on. So, but it is what this is supposed to be used for. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the public who wish to speak on this? Public comment is now closed. Council comments? Mr. President, I move that we approve this. No, uh, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Councilwoman Daisy Lee first. Mr. York, um, is this project going to help alleviate some of the septic issues north of 12? So, um, good question. Um, potentially. Um, there, uh, you know, there are a lot of septics I assume we're speaking of maybe the Long Beach area is that specific. There's a lot of things with that. Sanitary is involved in that. Um, could it potentially relieve? Yes. Yes. Actually, it was part of the original Long Beach plan was to build this. Um, it was all that maybe wasn't communicated very well, but it was part of that plan to build this. So what we did was we carved this out because we actually need this right now um, in the future. Yes, they could. I, I believe that. Um, but that's not for me. It's the planner. It's probably more for the sanitation district to um, work those things out. But but again, um, we, we won't let people build septics in the city. We don't, we require you to connect to sewer. So it will allow those 200, yacht, 200 mm -hmm. some odd lots I talked about to be connected to sanitation. Okay. I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry. It was a kind of a round of a bush. It does. Thanks. Yeah, and I do. I do have a uh, comment from the council, and being delays on to the sanitary district, I know that they've been talking about this lift station for uh, quite a while. Uh, it's nothing new that, and I'm not gonna. I have not heard the word overflow coming from this lift station. Yeah, and I and I don't want to use that because overflows is not the proper term, I believe, uh, but. To rebuild this lift station with the state financing and the uh, interest rate that we're going to get and the way the financing is set up, this what this is called is infrastructure for the future of Michigan City and for future development of Michigan City. And it has, in my mind, it has to be done and we need to move this uh, forward so we can get the money and get this lift station taken care of. Otherwise, 
to me, the development north, uh, the northeast quadrant of Michigan City and that area is going to be stymied for a long time to come. And any other com council comments? None? Motion. Motion to approve. Support. Motion to approve by Councilman Beatry and seconded by Councilman Dabney. Ms. Nyla on the vote. Mr. President Walensky. Aye. Ms. Tillman. Aye. Mr. Beatry. Aye. Mr. Coulter. Aye. Mr. Dabney. Aye. Dr. Cora. Aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Molinar. Aye. And Mr. Nelson. Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. And thank you, Ms. Nyla. And our first of a slew of ordinances here this evening, uh, if you would, our first ordinance uh, by title only. An ordinance on first reading by title only, an ordinance establishing salaries for the fire department of the city of Michigan City for the calendar year 2025. And this is introduced by Mr. Dabney, Ms. Tillman, and Mr. Don Presbolinski. And do the authors have anything they'd like to add at this time? Councilwoman Tillman. Um, just in regards to the uh, fire department ordinance, um, we are still under negotiations uh, with the fire and police department, which will be coming up the next one. But I just wanted to touch bases in regards to this um, ordinance for salary, where it states, whereas previously the Michigan City through the Common Council Labor Committee and Firefighters Local Number 475 on behalf of the firefighters of the fire department negotiated a fair and equitable contract for the year 2022 through 2024, the terms of which continues until a new contract is approved by both the city and the firefighters Local 475. And whereas due to the budget constraints, the city is only able to offer a one-time bonus to employees and is unable to offer any increase to the base wages of members of the Michigan City Firefighters Local Number 475. Thus, the base wage salaries established for the 2024 will remain in effect for the year 2025. Um, if you look down on there, it also indicates for Section 3, for the purpose of 2025, a firefighter subject to the salary ordinance shall be entitled to a one-time mid-year bonus in an amount of up to $1,200 payable second payroll in July 2025. To qualify for the bonuses, a city employee must a have been employed by the city in the preceding year 2024 however if the employee was hired after july 1st 2024 their respective bonus will be prorated accordingly b be a full-time employee or a permanent part-time employee and c be actively employed by the city at the time the bonus is dispersed in 2025. thank you councilwoman uh, anything from, I don't have any uh, comments, okay. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Oh, yes. Tommy Kowalik, 1360, you know how to stress, like Councilwoman Tillman said, the firefighter and the police, are con their salaries are negotiated through their union. Um, now that's listed all their, I know the firefighters, their salaries are listed in Article 12. Apparently, that's not going to increase. One thing I'd like to see, I know... But back in 2022, Mayor Perry put in that all the non-fire and police municipal fire are going to get a bonus paid vacation day during the month of their birthday. I'd like to see that put in for both the fire and police and both the chiefs and the deputy chiefs. I think that that's only fair if they're going to get. I think the rest of this, all the other city employees ought to get that too. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wish to speak? <laughs> Nick Pabone, President, Michigan City Firefighters, Local 475. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking the members of the Labor Relations Committee um, who was in attendance at our meeting. We were able to have uh, meaningful discussions by proposing several contract changes that are not financial in nature. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate. Looking ahead, we still have key financial matters that need to be addressed, not with the intention of straining the city's resources, but to ensure we can continue, uh, continue improving the services we provide. Our goal is to find ways to better serve the public, whether by enhancing safety, increasing response capabilities, or expanding the programs we currently have. We believe that by working together, we can 
find solutions that not only support the firefighters, but also benefit the city as a whole. With that said, I'm not here to get ahead of myself, but to continue working together in a fair and constructive way. We're confident that with good faith and cooperation, we can achieve a mutually beneficial agreement that strengthens both our workforce and the services we provide to the city. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone else from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Having none, this ordinance will be held over for a second reading at our next council meeting. Ms. Isla, our next ordinance on first reading and by title only. An ordinance on first reading by title only, establishing yeah. the salaries for the Michigan City Police Department for the calendar year 2025. And this is also introduced by Mr. Dabney, Ms. Toma, and Mr. Presbolinski. And would the authors like to add anything at this time? Thank you, Mr. President. Yep. And again, um, this is for the Michigan City Police Department in regards to the ordinance um, for their 2025 salary. I'll just read a couple of uh, phrases in their whereas and sections. Whereas previously, the City of Michigan City, through the Common Council's Labor Committee and the Michigan City Fraternal Order of Police, Dunes Lodge Number 75, on behalf of the officers of the Police Department, negotiated fair and equitable salaries for the years 2022 through 2024, the terms for which continues until a new contract is approved by both the City and Michigan City Fraternal Order of Police, Dunes Lodge Number 45. Whereas due to budget constraints, the city is only able to offer a one-time bonus to employees and is unable to offer an increase to the base wages of members of the Michigan City Fraternal Order of Police Dunes Lodge Number 75. At this time, thus the base wage salaries established for the year 2024 will remain in effect for the year 2025. Section number three, Reads, for purpose of 2025, a police officer subject to salary ordinance shall be entitled to a one-time mid-year bonus in an amount up to $1,200 payable, the second payroll in July 25. The quali the qu to qualify for the bonus, a city employee must A, have been employed by the city in the preceding year 2024. However, if the employee was hired after July 1st, 2024, their respective bonus will be prorated accordingly. B, be a full-time employee or a permanent part-time employee, and C, be actively employed by the city at the time the bonus is dispersed in 2025. Thank you, Councilwoman. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Having none, any council comments? No council comments. This ordinance will be held over for second reading at our next uh, council meeting. And that brings us to our next ordinance on first reading, Ms. Nyla, by title only. An ordinance on first reading by title only, approving additional appropriation in the budget of the refuse fund for repairs needed for refuse equipment. And this is introduced by Mr. President Belinsky and Mr. Dabney. And do the authors have anything they'd like to add at this time? Okay, uh, I will just state that this is for repairs that need to be uh, made to the refuse uh, trucks. And what we're doing is we are decreasing the unappropriated refuse fund of 2223, unappropriated balance of 300, and we're increasing the account number uh, 2223. 0 .000, 000, 000, 000 for three hundred thousand dollars, so the repairs can be made to the uh, vehicles. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wishes to speak on this ordinance? Paul Prisbolinski, seventeen sixteen Washington Street. Was this money appropriated out of Riverboat Fund? from last year's budget and then now being uh, transferred into uh, 2025's budget? According to the controller's office, no. Is this money from riverboat funding? Is that, no. the gen is that a refuge, the levy? 
Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance? Having none, any further council comments? No council comments, this ordinance will be held over for second reading and our next uh, council meeting. <clears throat> See, this here is also first reading on this. And this is for, uh, by title only, Ms. Nyla. In ordinance on first reading by title only, amending the zoning map of the city of Michigan City, LaPorte County, Indiana, to rezone real property located at 2308 Franklin Street, vacant lot facing South Street, situated beside 1701 Lafayette Street, parcel 4601331640120000022 slash 460. 133-164-001-000022, Michigan City, Indiana, from the R1 Zoning District Classification to B2 Zoning District Classification. And this is introduced by Mr. Gabney. And does the author have anything you'd like to add at this time? Uh, just to say this is well-covered ground when we talked about the petition. Uh, we're just talking about the property that was uh, rezoned down there uh, by Apex. And I'll just leave it at that for now on first reading. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Yes, Scott Mellon, to kind of place. There was one thing I, I wanted to add to my previous comments about this. It, uh, the petitioner also owns all the abutting properties to this. So this really affects no neighbors in any way. This is nothing but Good common sense, good business for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Prismolinsky, 1716 Washington Street. As I previously said, um, the uh, business has been there for 40 years. They've been good neighbors to the community. And since this isn't a money transfer, is, uh, can all three readings be done tonight if somebody... Uh, makes a motion so they can move this thing forward. Thank you. Anyone else from the public who wish to uh, speak on this ordinance? Anyone else from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Having none, any further council discussion? Okay, this ordinance will be held over for uh, second reading and our next council meeting. Ms. Nyla, our first ordinance on second reading by title only. An ordinance on second reading by title only, amending various sections in Division I generally and two Municipal Collection and Disposal Service in Article 4, Solid Waste in Chapter 98 of the Michigan City Municipal Code and creating Section 50-509 and Section 50-509. 510 in Article 25, Utilities in Chapter 50 of the Michigan City Municipal Code regarding solid waste garbage. And this is introduced by Mr. President Belinsky, Dr. Cora, Mr. Coulter, Mr. Beatry, Ms. Lee, and Mr. Dabney. And do the authors have anything that they'd like to add at this time? Councilman Dabney? Yes, uh, before we proceed, I'd like to um, make a motion to have an amendment by substitution um, on this ordinance. So. There's been a motion, is there a second? There's been a motion by Councilman Dabney. And, and I'd like to, I'm sorry, Don, um, Mr. President, can I read the, the amendment that's going in that we're ready to vote on here? Well, let's. I I think we have to get a second. Uh, I made can a motion. He read it. I made a motion. They made a second. He made a motion for the amendment. Can he go ahead and just read his motion then? I, I think you have a second already. Well, you got to have a second, right? I think you have one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Councilwoman Tracy Tillman made a second. Right. Okay. So go ahead and read the amendment. All right, and this is changing uh, section ninety-eight dash one one five right of entry. Um, except when action is needed to protect the public health, safety, or welfare, or to preserve property, the city department may enter upon private property when consent is obtained 
an administrative warrant is obtained and or any necessary notices have been provided. Nothing in this section requires a city department to seek consent of a private property owner when a city officer or employee remains on adjacent public property, such as a right of way or on other adjacent property for which uh, consent to entry has been obtained or to enter property in which the city has an easement for purposes authorized in that easement. So to kind of sum that thing up, um, if someone were standing out on a sidewalk, uh, that would be the public easement, they can look in and see um, any kind of violations or things of that sort. They cannot enter the public property unless they obtain a warrant or anything like that. But this is saying, you know, they will be able to see um, any kind of things that are going on from adjacent properties or any easement surrounding properties. Okay, so what's your, I guess, okay, so we got a, a, a we got a vote. Okay, now it's the vote to accept the uh, motion for the amendment. Okay, Ms. Nylum on a vote. Ms. Tillman. Aye. Mr. Beatry. Aye. Mr. Coulter. Aye. Mr. Dabney. Aye. Dr. Cora. Aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Uh, Ms. Moldenauer. Aye. Mr. Nelson. Aye. And Mr. President Belinsky. Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. Okay, do the, any of the other authors have anything that they'd like to uh, add or say about this ordinance at this time? Okay, I have, because uh, I didn't attend the workshop because I was out of, uh, out of town. Uh, one thing that I'd like to uh, find out, and I know that Mr. Carter's here, the refuse director, if you would come down front, please. <clears throat> yeah, good evening, Mr. Carter. Good evening, Chris Carter, 621 Emma Street, Refuge Superintendent. Yeah, one, one of my questions centers around are the toters, the carts, okay? And I know we have if you want an additional cart that you have to pay $120 annually. That's correct. Yeah. For the cart? Yes. How did the city how did the city come up with $120? And why, you know, if you bought, say if I say if I said, okay, Mr. Carter, I'd like another cart. You go, okay, Mr. Principal, let's see, that'll cost you $120. Okay, here's my $120. I own that garbage can, right? But now what are we saying? We have to pay rent on this can every year or am I reading this incorrectly? I believe they did a study based on the surrounding communities and that's how they came up with the price. Um, we just have an issue around town where people, you know, we, we feel like the limit based on the studies that's been done in other communities is two containers. Um, if you've noticed over the years, they've ordered other containers I think two separate orders, I can't remember what it was, but all those containers are out. So you have households who have four and five containers, you know, at a household. We feel like if the community is recycling, that the limit should be at two containers. Uh, like I said, that was something that was a study that was done around for other uh, surrounding communities. And that's how they came up with the figure. Okay, who did that, who did that study? Uh, I believe the mayor's office. Communities. Yeah, the mayor's office did it. Who did? I believe the mayor's office did it. Okay. And correct me if I, you, the council did have a workshop on this, correct? And I guess is that the correct information that the mayor's office did a study? Baker. Oh, Baker Tiller did a study on how much garbage cans cost for us? Oh, okay. And, but why? So if I buy the can, for You're technically not buying the can. The can remains at the residence. Even if you move, that can should remain at that residence. Okay. So I'm renting a can. I'm for renting a can. The garbage that you have. I'm, rent, I'm renting a second can for $120 a year. A third can. The third can for $120 a year. 
Okay. Okay. Because I don't think it says here that you can get, does it say, I don't see it in the ordinance where it says you can get two cans. If a, if a residency already has two cans, those two cans will remain. But uh, after yeah. that, no, I, I I'm fathered in type. Uh, yeah, I understand that. But it doesn't say that in here. I mean, if we're going to give people directions on how many cans that they could have, I think that that needs to be added to the ordinance to say that, okay, you can get two cans, you can have two cans at no cost. There's not adding. If you already have two cans, if you have one can and you want an additional one after this ordinance goes through, then it's the 120. It's, it's under the belief, and I'm just taking a guess at this, so don't take me at my word, is that whatever you have at your residency, that's what you're able to manage your household garbage with. Anything additional means that you're uh, giving additional garbage to us that we have to pay for it to go to the landfill. Now that's, this is my thinking on it. I'm not, I haven't really gone over it too much as far as the reasoning behind having to pay for the container. But to me, it's like you're, you're, you're adding extra garbage, which that has added up on us as far as uh, going to the landfill. So our, our landfill costs are through the roof right now because yeah, of extra I mean, garbage that we're taking. So yeah, there's a sort of a way, it's like a bumper guard in order to control you know, and, and we're trying to encourage people to recycle. Right. And that's the thing. Right. And I'm just, I'm just trying to get, understand the cost. Okay. And the cost was done through a study out of the mayor's office. And it, every, every resident can have two cans if they want them. The third can is going to cost you $120 a year. <laughs> right. Godfathered in. If you have a, if you only have, if you have two cans and you got one that, can. I got one can. You want another? So if I want another can, I can get another can from Freighton. Mm -mm. No, it's going to be 120 if you get another can. Okay. There's nothing in the ordinance. The ordinance is saying that you have but two you cans now. Two that's cans, your you're godfathered in. You get them right. cans. If you got one and you get another one, they're saying that you have to pay 120 a year for that additional container. Okay. Why? How did we come up with why? Why should you have to pay $120 rent on a garbage can every year for the second can? If I ask you for a second can, I got to pay rent for $120 on that can, correct? Every year. Yeah. We basically, you're leasing. I guess you would, if you want to call it a leasing, yeah. but you're paying for the additional garbage that you're putting into the system. You know, so if a person... If they recycle, if you got one can, you're recycling, you can maintain the one can, that garbage that you put in the system, that one can should suffice for your household. But if your household grows and you're adding additional garbage to it, then they're saying, hey, you got to pay 120 to have this additional container because we have limits on our budget on what we can do going to the landfill. It don't, it's not cheap and it's not free to take additional garbage to the landfill. Okay. If I could add to that, Mr. President, I, th I think his description is correct. This, it's better to not look at this as a rental fee for the can, but rather the, the garbage is just placed in the can. The idea is there's a cost associated, associated with processing additional municipal solid waste. It comes at a cost. And this is just an attempt to offset that added cost for more trash being put into the system. Okay. I just had to get an understanding right. of where these numbers came from and how they came about. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, I still think that we should just just sell the coder to the resident for 120 bucks and forget about renting it. Well, the only thing with that is, yeah. If you sell it to them, they take the toter with them when they move. They can move out of town. They can take the toter with them. Then we lose a toter. We have a we. Oh, either way, I mean, it's either you buy it, okay, I buy it, I live at 215 Gard Gardena, so that toter is going to stay at 215 Gardena Street, okay, because it's assigned to that address. So even if I get a second toter and I'm paying on it annually, I mean, I would think I would own that toter because I paid, paying for the say, I've been there five years, okay, and I... And I got a second toter, that'd be $700 that I'd be paying a rent on that toter for garbage. 
I have a request for 200 toters, I believe it is. I'm, I have to look at the list, and I only have 70. I can't meet all those requests. So we're giving toters away to people. You know, there are those who are going to suffer that can't meet their household needs. You know, so it costs to get those toters. We're, those toters are not being given to us. Now, if there's a grant out there that can, can get us some toters, you know, we can always revisit things December 31st of every year. There can be changes made to the ordinance. But, I mean, unless we can find free toter somewhere. No, I, I, understand. Yeah, sure. I understand that. And, you know, I know that there was supposed to be a uh, survey done this summer, this past summer, with the uh, interns that were sold, that were here. They were going to go out and count refuse uh, containers in the community. Yes. I don't know if that ever got done. I mean, I, I, I drive by some houses, and I've seen three, four Toters, and I know that there's not that many people living in the house. Right, and and we're aware of that, and that's where the we've done the auditing on it, and we're going to make the changes, and that's why the household that has over three toters, we're going to go back and take that third one back. You know, and okay. if you have two, if you already have two, then you you can hold on to the two. But if you want a third one, that means you put more garbage into the system. You know, and like I said, between the shortage with uh yeah. with the shortage with the containers. And the amount of garbage that we're hauling, you know, we have to offset the cost somehow. Okay, so right now we have a list of uh, homes that we know there's excess toters at that we're going to try to retrieve from the we are, homeowners. We are aware of households and businesses that we know that there's an excess amount of toters, and we will be retrieving those. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilwoman Pillman. With that being said, Mr. Carter, so the ones that you will be retrieving from residents' homes for those who have two or more, and knowingly you have two toters, will you place those toters at the correct residence where they belong? Because we don't know. Uh, we do have a... The residents uh, don't know, because I know they have numbers on yeah. them, but the residents don't know what their they numbers don't know. are. We do have a database with the numbers of where the address is. So will you reassign them to the correct yes. residence? Okay. That's, that's part of what we're doing now. Okay. And I'm also advising the residents to uh, stencil their addresses on there so that they'll be able to keep up with them because right but now... But that's defacing uh, city property. I know, but uh, but they have permission to do it because it marks it lets it know that is at that address. Because right now we got people who are taking toters from households, people who move and take the toters with them. <laughs> and so that household who had the assigned toters don't have them no more so technically they're re almost removed out of the system well mm -hmm. okay okay i mean as it's, it's, you know councilman, Cor councilman carl yeah mr carter uh, having listened to the discussion from what i'm understanding is each household will be given to one for recycling and the other one is for non-recycling mm -hmm. and if you want to have another extra non-recycling you have to pay 120 dollars per year so that the amount the city is paying the landfill to dispose of this waste, the cost right. is covered. Is right. that what you're saying? Just offset to some of the expense that goes Thank along you. with That's it. That's right. No, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to read something here. Okay, so you had said two two toters. Okay, right? If a household has two, yeah, toters. we're trying to limit to two. But now, yeah, but listen to what Dr. Cora just said. You can get one refuse toter and one recycle toter. So the second refuse toter doesn't play into this. No, it doesn't. Because right. that recycled toter is provided by uh, solid waste. Okay. So yeah, right. So you're counting these two toters. One no, we're not counting. We're not counting the. We're not counting the recycled container. We're counting the city's containers only. Pardon? I'm sorry. We're counting the city containers only. We're not counting the recycled toters. Okay. So if you want to consider, so we want to take it down house city container. Okay. Yeah. And one. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. That kind of cleared it up too a little bit. Yeah. Okay, uh, I had my comments. We didn't go to the public, but thank you, Chris. No okay. problem. I guess, uh, is there any more? 
Uh, comments from the authors? Yeah. Councilman Beatry, go ahead. Um, I, I didn't know if you were going to bring this up with the comments you were making, because this, this is relevant to the discussion we had before, before the meeting. My, my issue is with the, the refuse, it's with the yard waste. In section 98-146, uh, um, I had a conversation with a member of the community last at our last meeting. Oh, that's in another. It doesn't make much sense to me why we're uh, under yard waste bags, why we're requiring um, members of the community to buy a biodegradable paper bag if we're That's putting it in a 32 gallon plastic container, uh, the container should suffice to me. So I don't know why yeah. uh, okay. we're, we're asking, they're, ask, they're gonna have to buy a 32 gallon plastic bag anyway for their, their yard debris. Why are we requiring that they put it in a plastic bag first and then put it in a plastic one? Well, Chris, if you would, please, Ernie, let Chris come to the uh, podium. Yeah. So what, it says, what we're asking is that the residents put the compost bag, a 32-gallon bag, compost bag only, into a 32-gallon can. Part of the reason is that is because if you put the bag out by itself, a lot of people put it out in weather conditions, damage the bag. Bag gets wet, guys go to pick it up, or they put dirt in it, gets weighed down by the water or snow, compost is on the ground. Now it's got to be cleaned up. The reason why we are saying not put the compost in a, in a can by itself is because if you get a frost or a cold day, like toward the end of the year, we're still getting compost. That compost freezes in there. So now it's heavier, guys go to dump it, there's a risk of injury because that compost is not going to come out of there because they're gonna combine leaves and grass together and it freezes in there. So it makes it harder to get it out. If it's in a bag, it should be able to easily slide out. Not 100% sure that is gonna be more effective, but I think that that helps. Trust me, I've been out there. When, them, when that grass is frozen in them cans because of a frost overnight, it got down to 35 degrees, it's hard. And then a lot of times that can might get damaged because we're trying to, you know, our goal is to get it out of here. We're pounding against the truck that can cracks and it breaks. That way if it's in the bag, the hope is slide right out. So it's the weather conditions is the reason why we're asking for it to be that way. Any more questions, Councilman? Yeah, I, um, I understand your rationale now, at least. I don't know if I agree with it, but I understand what you're saying. The other issue I had was the uh, allowable yard waste containers. Um, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but when when we get rid of yard waste, I mean, we have so many storms around here like every week and limbs are coming down and bushes are dying. One one of those 32 gallon things is not going to take care of my house. And I don't even have a very big house. I, I think we ought to look at at least allowing three of those things because uh, I just don't think I don't think it's sufficient to take care of yard waste. Well, we're going to ask residents to buy a mulching lawnmower. I, when I cut my mother's yard, I'm using me for an example. I mulch my lawn. My lawn. I might have half a bag, uh, but we are trying to give alternatives to address that issue. So that's not something that we're we're blind to. Uh, so the hopes is when I. Can't say for sure, nothing's in paper right now, but we're gonna to try to create a dumping site for compost so people can take the extra tree limbs and stuff there to get rid of it. So we are coming up with alternatives. So that is our goal. And like I said, I hope to create a dumping site that'll be available for residents to go there. I think that's what they do in Hobart. So they have a dumping site, you can take your extra compost there. But we're just thinking about injury to the guys. You know, you go to a residence, I've had some mm -hmm. visitors. Uh, we might got 12 bags out there. We got one resident, he got 13 cans every week. That's got to be done. But those guys got to wrestle with. You know, that's got to be done manually. Okay. Okay. I have uh I have comment on that same line, you know. And I think, Chris, you and I talked about this, and I asked you, what's the deal with one 
32 gallon garbage can for yard waste, I can guarantee you there's only one person in my block on Gardena Street that can use one 32 gallon garbage can. I know I can't. I know when I cut my grass, guaranteed two, possibly three. And now with the fall coming and leaves coming, I guarantee you I could use more. Uh, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. Uh, whatever kind of logic, and I know we're trying to save people from being injured or what have you, but possibly where there's a house where somebody has 13 garbage cans sitting outside, somebody needs to go out and talk to the resident and say, can you possibly cut this back? Because I, with one can, I, I will not support. Uh, well, our support. resources there, limit us to what we Chris, can do. It just doesn't make sense to me. Well, our resources limit what, what we can do. Right now, we're having a hard time picking compost up because we're doing fall cleanup. We're doing our regular garbage pickup. And so there's days where compost, we almost can't get it. And if we got to go out and we got to get pick up five and six cans at a stop, I mean, there's going to be times we can't get compost. So you then know, what's going to happen? The people come. Yeah. And, and I'm not telling you guys how to do your job. But if that's the case where you're saying, well, we got fall cleanup and we got this and that, <laughs> and we won't be able to maybe get to the yard cleanup, then maybe the city should just tell everybody, you know what, throw your yard waste and everything right by the curb, and when they do the fall cleanup and suck leaves up every other week, we'll just pick it up all at one time. You see what I'm saying? And that's why we have yeah. spring cleanup and the fall cleanup to alleviate the extra that's put out. Yeah, and, and then, so and then the, other, the other thing that you had said as far as uh, – creating a dump site, okay? And then maybe the people can come and bring their yard waste there. Why don't we create the yard, why don't we create the dump site first, continue on doing what we're doing, and then tell people, once we get the dump site fixed, then you can tell the folks, hey, go ahead and bring your stuff out to the dump site if you want to. Yeah, I think we're putting the uh, cart before the horse here. And one, I, I can guarantee you, my neighbors, I can guarantee you, they cannot go with one 32-gallon garbage container. I don't care how much you want to recycle. I don't care how much uh, mulching mowers you want to use or whatever your ecological ideas are. But I just can't see it happening. Well, again, we're doing this based on what other communities do. So when we run shorthanded, how do we make up for that? How do we pick up the compost and pick up the garbage when we ain't got enough people or we ain't got enough equipment? You know, it, it's a rough day. We got to go up there and pick up garbage all day. Well, then, and you got to turn around. You got to go pick up compost, too. I mean, if you're, yeah, if you're asking me a question, then I'll give you an answer that if you're going to say, well, hey, we don't have enough people to do this. We don't have enough people to do that. And we, you only can have 132 gallon garbage can, okay, then what are people going to do with the rest of their stuff? They're going to wind up packing it in garbage cans and dumping it out in the country or something like that and getting rid of it? The cane mulch? Nobody can buy a mulch a lot more? That's all I'm asking. So my please. Yeah, I, I know, but Chris. Please let me come in. Chris, no, no, wait a minute, Councilman Dabney. I'm not done, sir. That not everybody can go out and afford a $1,000 a uh, mulching lawnmower mm. or a $700 Toro lawnmower or whatever you want to buy just because the city's, boom, decided to go with one 32-gallon garbage can. So how do we heat, how do we meet the high demands when they come up? And we looked at it like in the summertime. I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you my perspective from a citizen that well, what's wants the alternative? Let me know. services. Let me know the alternative and I can come. We'll, we'll work with that. We, me and you can yeah. sit down. And we can I, come I can't give you an alternative right now. I can't give you an alternative right now. Well, this is the you, you, you that give we me a call. Here. You give me a call, and you show me what the resources are and however you want to do it, and maybe I can come up with a suggestion. We're short-handed, and we're low on equipment. Okay, that's where we at. Okay, go ahead, Councilman Dabney. Mr. Carter, would you you can please go back to your seat? These are his opinions, and I mean, he, he's just he's telling us how he's going to vote. I mean, he, he he doesn't agree with the ordinance, and there's other eight other council members up here who are going to vote because nothing was going to get solved right there going back and forth. He wasn't going to be able to answer all the questions 
to Councilman uh, Prevalisky's liking. And so, uh, Mr. We, Mr. Dabney, no, I'm just saying, we, no, we, we look, hold on, hold on. It was going to go hold back on. and forth, man, to 10 o'clock tonight. Councilman Dabney, Councilman Dabney, I had questions for the department head, and I have the right yes. to ask the department head the questions. But you didn't and have, I think you didn't have the right to just cut me off, though. And I think he understands. That's the last time you'll do that. What I was saying to him. I don't need anybody interrupt, inter, interpreting what I'm trying to accomplish. Thank you. Go ahead, if you still want to speak, Councilman. No, point was made. Any other comments? Councilwoman Daisy Lee. Thank you. Yeah, as far as the mulching lawnmowers, as far as I'm aware, most homeowners lawnmowers have the option for a bag or mulch. It doesn't have to be a separate um, expensive lawnmower. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, that's the case. Yeah. That's well in an hour. Right. Um, I also want to bring to the attention of the public and the council persons that LaPorte County Solid Waste District does have a compost site. So for people that have really lots of things that need to be dealt with, that it can be taken over to the LaPorte County Solid Waste District. And that's right by the LaPorte County Fairgrounds there. So there is another resource available. Councilwoman Tillman. Um, with this ordinance on second reading, um, we can make, or whomever of the council can make amendments to this this evening, correct me? Uh, yes, that's correct. And in particular, if there's an issue regarding the number of cans that you think is appropriate, if you want to make an amendment, you can make an amendment. Yeah, but don't you have to have them prepared to hand out to the council members? Well, if we're just going from one to two, it's pretty straightforward. Pardon? If we were just going from one to two cans, for example, it would be pretty straightforward. That amendment would be pretty straightforward. Oh, so that's legal? You don't have to have it printed on paper then? I you can do a verbal? I think it's something that we could have prepared pretty quickly if it's that that small of a change. And the clerk can correct me if I'm wrong. Just have your amendment has to be in writing according to our rules and regulations. Council rules. Okay, but we'll, 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 we will finish with council comments right now. Okay. And Dr. Cord, did you have a chance to, uh, okay. And now we'll go to public comment and then we'll come back and finish up what the council is going to do here. So we have public comment right now. Dennis Hirsch, 210 Kenwood Place. With that whole discussion, you were missing the point. My grass is mulched. But when I start trimming, when I have damage, there's no way I get by with one container. I don't ever put grass into the containers. It's trim bushes, trim vines, damage from a storm, stuff that falls out of the trees. And one container, I could save a pile and put it out there every week and never get caught up. And as far as taking it to a dump site, I don't own a truck and I'm not going to buy a truck so I can take stuff to some mulching site, whether it's in Michigan City or Laporte. It makes no sense. And we're talking about putting a bag in a can, which to me is the height of ridiculousness. And I'm sorry, I think the sanitation department does a good job, but that is absolutely ridiculous to handle the one time a year you might get frozen stuff in the can. And if somebody puts a lid on the can, it doesn't freeze inside. And you're not getting grass clippings in November, December, and January. So those provisions make no sense at all. Mm -hmm. Let, let's double and triple everything because one time every five years, they got a problem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Consum or Paul Przybylski was up. Ahead. That's all right. I'll yield to Tom. Okay. Tommy Kulavik, 1316 Ohio. First of all, I moved here on November of 2013. I know the whole time that Ron here was the mayor, I never had any problem with my compost pickup. They were there every Friday, Johnny on the spot, you know, three days after compost pickup day. 
And all of a sudden, since Dwayne was the mayor, now Angie's mayor. I'm probably not getting my compost pick. I have Labor Day. They didn't do the compost pickup so they can have the Saturday off. So, you know, I, I took my grass clippings out to Hitchcock. They let me dump them out there that week. Uh, what I was saying, what about as far as the, the extra recycling? What about the two and three resident uh, 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 family units? Do they have to pay uh, $220 a year for, for their extra uh, receptacles? What about all these people that take their solid waste and, and overfill and dump all their garbage? I got right down the alley, I got two of them. They took their solid waste and just filled all the garbage and the, the refuse isn't collecting it. They got just trash all over the alley in the backyard. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. I think, you know, Mayor Angie, she, she needs to do a better job of just handling the basic day-to-day -day operations of the city. And that's the one area where Mayor Mayor really, I feel is really, well, what was the better mayor as far as that goes? Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, uh, I've been listening to everybody's point of view. And I think we should all take a deep breath and just step back a moment and think about how this all got started. This started during the uh, period of people coming to Michigan City and trying to uh, gain an opportunity in throwing their waste on remodeling and doing construction work right out in their yards and not getting a dumpster or anything like that, which drove up the cost for the sanitary district. We were working on that last year, but evidently nothing came to fruition to bring those dump charges down. But what I would like to say is that, and I'm not trying to tell somebody how to run something, but maybe you need to expand their base wages. Maybe we need to give a, container for like the recycle toter for yard waste. So we won't have no injuries. And these guys will be using the toters to dump it in the green machine. They, I don't know if they still have it, okay? But there's a lot of simple solutions here. A lot of simple solutions. You put, a, if, if the other um, sanitary trucks won't, you know, they're already outfitted to tip those oh, yeah. containers out. Um, the, the other thing is how many, how are we taking our garbage to the dump? Is the whole crew going or is there a truck available for a crew to keep going and you got a driver or two drivers taking the truck over to the dump? So here's what I propose. Mr. Beatry, I agree with you. I agree with Councilman Przbolinski on yard waste. I live on a corner lot. I cut that grass. I, I got two containers packed with grass to get them in there in two containers. But my point is this. I've thought about this for years. Those guys that are on that compost truck, it should be made into a toter truck and if you have two toters, you're keeping the city clean. You're keeping their yard waste in there. You're keeping, you're, it's a beautification item. And we should buy some toters that we can use there. Tell me to paint a green dot on one of my containers. But I think there's a way out of this and it, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to look at it. And I think that you guys should table this thing and let's work it out. Let's work it out. Finally, I don't think I should be paying for a dumpster because I want to remind you that those were all bought out of riverboat money. That's the only thing that I got out of the riverboat was a tote dumpster. And everybody's, I appreciate everybody's point of view. Sir, could you summarize, please? Yeah, I think you guys should. I, you had a lot of good points. Mr. Beatry had a lot of good points. I think you should table this. And I am upset that someone is trying to impeach the president's opinion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Ernie Holla, I am thrilled to Gladys Street. I don't know how we got off on solid waste when we're Pardon? discussing this $120 for a no. container. I thought. 
I thought my taxes paid for the garbage pickup and services. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Then why do I have to pay another $120 for another container? Although I don't need another one, but somebody might. And it's ridiculous, $120. I, I do not agree with this. You should table this and take it back to them and straighten it out. Because I pay my taxes, county and city. And you do too. So I do not agree. They, they are wrong to charge you for that container. Especially now he says it comes from the riverboat. Thank you, sir. Hello, Scott Mellinger of Kenwood Place. Yeah, garbage is a hot thing. Uh, first, I want to thank the council and the attorneys for hearing my concerns uh, last meeting about the language that was modified in that amendment. I think that's well done. Uh, the two card thing is part of my notes, too. Uh, right now, we're grandfathering existing people who have two carts. The people are getting this all wrong. It's not about the cart. It's about the weight. It's about the garbage in the cart and the cost for the city to dispose of it. The cart is just a vehicle. Um, but if we're going to charge for a second cart, I say there's no list of existing two carts. Or if it is, it's completely out of date. When somebody buys a house, when a house is sold, it comes with two carts. You've got two carts. Nobody's keeping track of that. Um, I think we do an education campaign letting people know we're gonna start charging for a second cart as of January 1st. If you don't want it, turn over your sec, clean out your cart, turn it over upside down by the curb and we'll collect it. We'll get some carts back in circulation that way. If you're gonna charge for a second cart, just start charging for it because nobody's gonna maintain a list of who has one, who has two, who sold a house, when does it go back to one cart? Um, the yard waste, we're all in agreement on that. I never put grass in my barrels. My house came with six 32 gallon cans for waste. It's, it's the leaves, it's the twigs, it's the trimmings, it's the deadheading, it's not grass, it's all the other stuff. One is certainly a joke. Uh, three, maybe even four is a more reasonable number, in my opinion. Um, and I also would encourage you to possibly table this ordinance to work out some of these details. You can see it brings a lot of heat. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. We're picking up for some apartment complexes, complexes with, I think, 100, even 200 units. Why are we picking up their garbage? That's low hanging fruit. Let's get them off the list. Businesses, the new ordinance allows for three cans for a business. I know a restaurant by me that has six garbage cans. Why are we picking up for restaurants? Mm -hmm. So before we change it for the residents of Michigan City who are gonna have strong opinions about this as witness tonight, let's go after the low hanging fruit, the apartment complexes, the businesses. They should have never been on municipal service to start with, in my opinion. Um, and I'd like to thank, I'd like to recognize Vice President Tracy Tillman for standing in for you last week or two weeks ago and doing a, a fine job of it. And again, thank you for my concerns about the language about um, uh, coming on people's property. I think that's a wise, very sound uh, modification. And again, thank you for hearing my concern and acting on it. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Anyone else from the public wish to speak on this topic? Okay, public uh, comment is closed. Now we're coming back to the amendment. And the amendment was for, go ahead. If I can um, make a comment in regards to the amendments, amendments can be done. However, I would recommend if this is not tabled, if it's not tabled, that you do the amendments, which can be done on third reading at the next council meeting, but it would have to be done by a two thirds vote. No. I believe it's unanimous. It has to be unanimous. Okay. I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Was that a motion? No, I've just given it option. Oh, you're just to talking? To table it yeah. or make amendments on? Tracy. I'm sorry. Thank you. I was just um, given options. Either we can make amendments or it can be tabled. <laughs> Any other comments? Councilman Beatry? 
let me preface this by saying I I understand 100% where refuse is coming from. I'm sensitive to their needs. We do have to do things differently than we've been doing in the past. There's no question about that. But there's things here that I that I think we we should change, and mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable doing it without it being in in writing and without it being available for the public to look at as well prior to another meeting. This is an ordinance that isn't going to go into effect until next year anyway. So it's, it's not something we have to do right away. So I'm going to recommend that we table it and still and do more work on it. If that's a motion, I would like to second it. Okay, that, that is a motion. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm second. So the motion by Councilman Beatry and seconded by Councilman Cora, Nusnailab, on the vote. Okay, wait a second. Or let's stay on the vote. And this is a vote to table it. Mr. Beatry? Aye. Mr. Coulter? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Nay. Dr. Cora? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Molinar? Aye. Mr. Nelson? Nay. Uh, Mr. Prezobolinski? Aye. And Ms. Tolan? Aye. We have seven in favor and two opposed. I'm talking about this one. Okay, and I think the, the next question that comes about is, and I don't know if it had to be done during the motion, you know, how long it's tabled for. That's actually what the clerk and I were talking about. It's tabled automatically to the next meeting unless the motion says otherwise. We'll table till it's tabled until meeting. our next meeting. All right, so it's tabled till the next meeting. Okay. Okay, uh, moving on to our next ordinance on Mr. President, can I make a comment? Sure. Um, I was going to suggest that we should have a workshop and there's a lot of input that we received. I think we need to uh, get together and see how we can resolve some of the issues, address the concerns of Mr. Carter and also the concerns of citizens and come to a solution that will work for everybody. Okay, and if, if you would, doctor, if you would, <clears throat> take a look at the, you know, the calendar. I know we got a couple of workshops coming up, uh, wheel tax, and there's something else. That, oh, tomorrow night we got that park meeting, but that won't play any play into this. But yeah, if we can get a uh, workshop put together as quickly as possible, so maybe by the next meeting we'd have something to move on with. Yeah. I'd appreciate if you could do that. Okay. And if you want to do it on Wednesday because you're off, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. We're moving on to our uh, next reading on our next ordinance on second reading. And is that the tree ordinance? Yes, it is. Okay, let me get over there. Okay, yeah, that would be uh, creating section 50 522, an article, uh, what's that, 26 of vegetation of chapter 50. So that's what the uh, tree removal permit and fee. Yeah. So, Ms. Nyla, by title only, please. An ordinance on second reading by title only, creating section 50-522 and article 26, vegetation of chapter 50, fees and fines, and creating section 102-54 and article 2, trees, shrubs, and other plants of chapter 102, vegetation of the Michigan City Municipal Code to establish a tree removal permit and fee. And this is introduced by Mr. Dr. Cora, Mr. Coulter, Ms. Lee, and Ms. Mulder. And do the authors have anything they'd like to add at this time? 
Mr. President, I just had one comment. Uh, and I think uh, during the discussion, uh, during our last meeting, uh, concerns were expressed about uh, making it too onerous by having to submit a site plan and clearly marking the trees designated for removal, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, that's, those portions have been removed and this has been made simpler. Thank you. Okay, just give me an answer. Just trying to catch up with my, uh, there it is. Okay, uh, those are amendments that are being made. Okay, so there's been a an amendment made, an author's amendment. That's an author's amendment. Amendment by deletion. Oh, amendment by substitution. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Pardon. Pardon, what are you saying, Gail? The highlighted portion, the in the red, yeah, in in two in, 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 C, uh, those are those are being deleted. Yeah, so we got the submission of the site plan, and eliminate the current photo of tree designated for removal. That's incorrect. Right? So does that stay? Photo. Yes, the photo. Yes, the one in red. Yeah, that goes. I don't have that. Yeah. It's the amendment dated October 15th. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So the Dr. Uh, Cora made a uh, amendment uh, by substitution. And is there a uh, second? Second. Okay. And Councilman Coulter seconded that. Uh, Ms. Nyla. No, is there any... Uh, Public comment on the amendment? I just have one comment. Ernie Hollihan's 302 Gladys Street. I I don't agree with the uh, fee for the permit. That's just going to be passed on to the person that's getting the tree taken down. Not the, the tree service people are not going to accept it. They're going to pass it on. Mm -hmm. So that's going to cost $50 more. So if I have a tree removed, and they're they're very expensive anymore. That that's been omitted. That that's no longer there. The fifty dollars. No, it's it's still it's still there, Councilman Beatrice. It just has to be removed by making an but, amendment. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But it's just, and it's I don't easy. see it marked out, but I know it has been marked out on another copy uh, that I saw. But anyway, we are dealing with uh, Councilman Cora's amendment. So, yeah. There's yeah. two versions. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. We have two amendments that we're doing tonight. Right. This one so, is the one that's $50. So, we need to take one at a time. Right. And that's what we're doing. We're taking Dr. Cora's uh, amendment right now. So, is there any other public comment? On the amendment, any other public comment? None? Okay. Any uh, council comment? Any council comment? All right, Ms. Nylab, on the uh, vote, please. Mr. Coulter? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Doug, would you say yes? Oh, aye. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cora? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Mr. Molden Ms. Moldenauer? Aye. Mr. Nelson. Aye. Mr. Prezbolinski. Aye. Ms. Tillman. Aye. And Mr. Beatrice. Aye. We have uh, nine in favor and no one opposed. Okay. And then the uh, next amendment, and I uh, made that amendment uh, to eliminate the uh, $50 fee. Uh, you know, whether it's the uh, resident that has to come down and get the uh, permit, and I don't think that that, was, uh, that that was explained, but it's either the the homeowner has to come and get the permit or the contractor has to come and get the permit. And for $50, 
I don't know, and there are a number of cities that do not charge a permit. And I know we got that email today, and I don't have that in front of me. I know I had it, but, oh, here we go. It's right there. Yeah. Okay, for example, uh, a flora permit is required for any tree planting. That's in Indianapolis. Uh, Portland, Oregon, I'm assuming, they have a non-refundable application fee payable to the city of Portland. I don't know if that's Portland, Indiana, or is that Portland, Oregon? I don't know. Anyway, Beverly Shores, they pay $50. Lafayette pays $25. Uh, South Bend, no permit required to cut trees on private property. Permit required to cut city trees around your house. Fee charged for disposal of a tree uh so big okay and yeah so there are some cities that do not require permit and do not charge for a permit so it's not like we are doing something out of the ordinary and for 50 for 50 dollars i guess you come to the to city hall go see the forester say uh this is what i want to do cut this tree down and they'll probably put it in a computer and maybe come out to the site to see how it's handled and managed and disposed of. And to me, I don't think that requires a uh, $50 uh, payment. Uh, I Because I know even if we charge the contractor, he's going to charge that fee down to the resident anyway. And I know that there is, you know, the other fees have all been, are going to be raised. Uh, there's other things of, raising funds for the city. And I don't think that we need uh, to go out and have to spend or charge somebody $50. I guess where we could make the money up, if that's what we're trying to do here, is, and I don't see any uh, violation that if the permit is not obtained, how much the contractor or homeowner has to pay a, a fine. And I don't know if there's any uh, implication to that i don't see it in the ordinance so i just think if, if we wanted to make some way to cover for the fee that if you want to put a fine in place then put a fine in place to say three hundred dollars and that would cover a lot of uh upfront paperwork and things like that for a for a, a while and and i can I don't have a problem with the concept of having contractors register for a permit. That way we know who's coming to town, who's cutting trees down. And I'm gonna use a prime example because I'm sure you were all aware of it and drove past it, but the former Al Whitlow homestead on Cool Spring Ave in Jackson Street, there was a contractor that came to town and there was uh, giant oak trees there and you know you can cut down the trees on your property all you want but how you get to dispose of them things like that and it, it was it was a uh it was a mess and it got taken care of but i don't know if that contractor was even a uh a license i don't think they were a licensed contractor from what i heard so anyway so that's my amendment to uh eliminate the 50 dollar fee for this and is there a second? Support. And there is a second by Councilman Beatry and Ms. Nyla. Is there any other further council comment on the amendment? Is there any public comment on the amendment? Yeah. yeah. What you want? I wanted to make comment. Oh, okay. You can. Now, Mr. Wolf, could you hold on, please, for uh, Councilwoman Molinauer wanting to make a comment. Thank you, President, for recognizing I wanted to make a comment. Um, being one of the sponsors of this ordinance, I was very surprised to see um, $50 drop to zero um, without knowing anything about that until I saw this ordinance, um, you know, right before um, coming here today. Um, 
I have two thoughts about this. Um, one of the thoughts is that I think the city is trying to move away from doing everything for free. Okay. Um, even filing of permits for other things does require a minimal fee because we're taking up staff time just to process these and be sure they're in the computer um, to be sure the paperwork has been handled properly. So I think this gets away from a movement that we've been trying to actually cover the cost of our employees' time. Um, and certainly our foresters' time is, is valuable. And um, so I want to say that um, if $50 seems too steep, then maybe we could come, you know, to an agreement. But I really want Tilly Baker to look at this so that we're keeping in line with all of the recommendations they have made regarding all of our fees so that we use their expertise and we're also taking into account the surrounding communities, the state of Indiana, to see where we're coming in here at, okay? Um, I can understand residents being concerned that that $50, yes, of course, is gonna be passed on to you by the person that's cutting the tree down. So I am hearing that. Um, so I'm just looking up at this as a, a piece of a bigger objective that we're trying to um, <clears throat> actualize as a city. Okay, the second part of this is um, just in my neighborhood and all over Michigan City, I've just seen so many trees cut down over this summer. Um, to me, it's been alarming, the number of trees that have been cut down. And it's not just one or a couple. I'm talking about people going through and clear cutting their lots of every single tree that they have. So I don't know if contractors are going around and telling people you're in danger of a you know limb or tree falling in your house or what's happening, but I have not seen a trend like this for, for several years now. So I think putting in this as a as a sort of a stopgap measure, people are going to think about cutting down the trees in their yard if they have to go to the city council. And I realize you can do whatever you want to in your yard. You can cut down as much as you want. Yet at the same time, our city is losing so much of its, so much of its tree canopy. And this does affect the quality of the oxygen we're breathing in. It also affects the temperatures that our city is absorbing. And I look upon this as a much larger health, well-being, and quality of life issue. So um, I really would like to um, get the information from Tilly Baker, look at the other fees we're charging just for an application that may not or may require follow-up and um, equal those out so we're not, um, you know, out of range for anything. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, at this time, we'll take the vote on the amendment that I had uh, presented. Ms. Nylum? We have to do it. No, no. I got ahead of myself on the last uh, uh, amendment. So we should have had, okay. after we make the amendment, second it, then we, we take the vote on it. So that was a mistake on my part. So okay. at this time, we'll take a uh, vote, Ms. Nylum, on the amendment. So, did you call for public comment on the amendment? Yes, I did. That's what I thought too. Well, then go through with it. I don't think it was concluded. Pardon? I don't think the public comment was concluded. I think there's still a couple of people in the audience that didn't get a chance to comment. Okay. I don't think anybody got a chance to comment. Nobody got a chance to comment. So, all right, we'll have public comment. Go ahead. Oh, before we do, I'm sorry. Five minute recess. Okay, we'll call the more. We'll call the uh, meeting back to order, uh, and we are we are up to the vote for uh, the amendment for a zero uh, permit fee. Ms. Nylum on the vote. <laughs> Public. 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 Yeah. Okay. Did we, okay. We agreed to do public comment. Okay. All right. Public comment. 
Once more into the brief. Hello, Scott Mellon, Jim Kenwood Place. Um, given the confusion over this and the two amendments proposed, I would suggest we table this and put forth a clean ordinance uh, down the road. Um, one of the concerns expressed was um, uh, this is, again, this is a permit if you hire a company to cut down a tree. Mm -hmm. People are still allowed to do their own work. So to be practical, the company would have to come in and get this permit because part of the ordinance is they have to show their license, their, I think their arborist credentials and so forth, their workers' comp. So the, the homeowner, frankly, wouldn't be able to do this. Um, so we're adding a step of some bureaucracy to simply cutting down a tree, which in general, I'm not for. Uh, Councilwoman Moldenhauer's uh, brought up some very good points that we're losing a lot of our trees, but this doesn't really address that. Um, but she brought up very good points about saving our trees. But part of the the part of the reason, well, I guess the amendment is to drop the fee. But don't add bureaucratic headache to the thing. Don't add work to the workforce that has to be covered by a fee that we're now dropping. Um, so more steps, uh, table it for a clean version would be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wish to speak? I uh, would like to know. Name and address, sir? Uh, Paul Prisbolinski, 1716 Washington Street, lifelong resident of the second ward. Uh, I would like to know how many incidents that we've had with the uh, outside contractors uh, coming in and doing whatever they're doing, if, if we've been tracking this. So then we'll have an idea of what what what's going on, because I believe that a lot of the people already know that we have a tree ordinance. And I believe that being an arborist, they have to have insurance. They got to be bonded, I believe. So, you know, is it just adding to the bureaucracy or are we, are we accomplishing not cutting down more trees or is telling somebody, oh, don't cut that tree down because what I think is that if you do do this, that maybe you should put in there that the city will do a survey of the property to see if it's even their tree. Because there's a condition right now on Wabash Street at in the uh, 1700 block, because a lot of people don't know that that street was supposed to be a boulevard and the property lines come up like two to three feet from people's front porch. The reason I know about it, we lived at 1620 and we knew where the property line was at. So there's another tree on Earl Road that I just think that, you know, if we're gonna do this the right way, there's a lot of, there are a lot of trees that are, are dying and they need to be taken care of because you, according to the ordinance, you can't top them out. So, if you're going to do something about trees, do it all the way. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any other public comment? Mr. Wolf, go ahead. I'd like to uh, first request that the council vote against removing the $50 fee from the permit language. Um, and I should, I want to give some background to everyone on what the $50 is for, where it came from, and how it came to be. Um, the $50 fee is a price that I came up with. Now, I didn't pull the number out of the air, and I didn't go to Baker or Tilly, is it Tilly Baker or Baker Tilly? Thank you, Baker Tilly. I was kind of late to the game on that one. They had already started their finalization of their program. Um, however, um, the the permit amount and I, the I'm going to read the rest of the uh, the correspondence that I submitted to the council this morning um, on other companies or other cities, excuse me, other cities who have fees or don't have fees and what they do. 
the $50 fee came as I did research into other cities. Um, I looked at these other cities plus multiple more. I talked to other city foresters and arborists, and the $50 fee was the price that seemed to be the most reasonable for what I was asking. Um, what I submitted to the council this morning via email is a comparison of other cities and how they handle tree removal permits. First off, there's no statewide permit required. Indiana does not have a statewide tree removal permit requirement. Local officials have the authority, and I would like to add and responsibility, to enact any specific tree removal regulation or situation where a permit may be required. In Indiana, responsibility for damage, even without a permit, the property owner is still responsible for any damage caused by tree removal to the neighbor's property. The tree, according to Indiana, where the, the base of the tree is, is who owns the tree. So if you have a tree growing up, if your neighbor has a tree growing up that covers over your property, let's say it's a large maple, it may cover 30 feet of your lawn, maybe doing damage to your house, maybe doing damage to your roof, maybe dropping debris, you don't want that. In Indiana, that's still his tree. However, as a property owner, you can go to your property line, ground the sky, and remove any limb of his tree that's over your property. So that's in the provision already from the state. Um, there is a slight caveat to that. It's kind of humorous in my opinion. Uh, in Indiana, if you have, if your neighbor has an apple tree and you remove all the limbs, you can do that, but you have to give the apple back to the neighbor. They're still hit. And that's, it's an old law that's still on the book. But I did this internet search, so the information is based on as much accuracy as you can get from the internet. But Beverly Shores has a $50 permit. And it says in their site that if the permit is not obtained before removal, except for emergency due imminent threat, as required by their code 155.064, as amended, the cost of the permit shall be twice the amount of the fee. Plus, this additional fee, in addition to and not in lieu of any fine that may be imposed for violating the town code. We do have, and it's not written into that, this ordinance or this paperwork, we already have in other ordinance fines and fees for doing work without being properly licensed. The problem is catching. Um, Lafayette has a $25 permit, and that shall be attained before any person may remove, cut, or plant any tree, shrub on public property or public areas of private property within the city. The city of LaPorte. Now, the city of LaPorte does not have a full-time arborist on duty. They don't have a staff member as an arborist. Um, they have just a tree board. However, a written permit is required with a site plan, with a site plan, to remove a tree in Laporte. Uh, Indiana, um, unless it's a branch less than a half an inch in diameter, the permit can be, be requested by filling out a tree service form that is their, their permit form. And they state on their site that Indiana law states that the owner of the property where the tree's trunk is located is responsible for the tree. I talked to their city forester. Granted, they don't have one on staff. Um, I know the guy who's the, he is the uh, city forester for Michigan, for LaPorte, and he works as an advisor to their tree board. I talked with him about this, and so some of this information also came from him, not just from their website. 
um, the city of South Bend. And again, this one I took from their website and also talked to the city forester for the city of South Bend. There is up front no re permit required to cut a tree on private property for the city. However, hey, a permit not required to cut a tree in around your house and a fee charge for disposal of the tree at $3.65 per cubic yard. I estimated that a small tree produces 55 cubic yards of debris, which would cost you $200 for the disposal of the tree. They don't have a charge of $50 fee to cut the tree, but they're going to charge you $200 to get rid of it. And that's a small tree. A large tree can have three times that size volume of debris. So, yes, they don't charge you 50 bucks to cut the tree. They're going to charge you 600 to get rid of it. Uh, tree lawn, the area between the road and the sidewalk. Uh, this is the area we call our city trees. South Bend has a different set of rules. Municipality can set those rules. The tree lawn is a responsibility of the adjacent property owner. So the city doesn't go out and cut their tree if it needs trimming. They're responsible to do that. Um, if there's a dead tree in the front and the tr homeowner says, I can't afford to remove it, the city of South Bend has a slightly different view than we do. And the city of South Bend will mitigate the problem at a cost of $400 an hour. So if you can't afford to have it done in, in South Bend, they'll do it for you. But they're going to charge you $400 an hour to do it. Now, I did talk to their forester, and they have set up a payment plan with people. So they get paid every month for doing work that uh, nobody can afford. Um, item C, was any person found in violation of the provision of the article whose property becomes listed as continuous enforcement property, i.e. you have a resident who continues to not take care of their property. Um, they fall under the continuous enforcement property. They are fined the sum of $500 per violation for the first calendar year. And then they have an escalating rate. So if the person doesn't take care of their property, the second year, an additional fee is added, and it's higher than the first. And third year, consequently the same, until they say enough's enough, we're going to mitigate this, and it's going to cost you $400 an hour. Thereafter, each violation shall be fined and assessed an administrative fee related to the cost incurred by the city for inspection, abatement and, and administration and penalty. Indianapolis. Indianapolis, Indiana has a flora permit. It does not have a tree permit. They call theirs a flora permit. They also have a caveat in their permit that it's required that an ISA certified arborist do the cutting of a tree. That we don't, we don't do that in the city. We just say they have to be a licensed tree company with the city. We don't require them to have an ISA certified arborist do the work. Um, and that's for any tree planting, landscaping, spraying, bracing, removal, or pruning of work in the city right away. And again, I believe Indianapolis has that same caveat that if it's in front of your house, even if it's on city property, at your tree, you're responsible to take care of it. The city of Evanston, they have a, a standing tree preservation permit. So if you want to remove a tree, it's $80 per tree, not $50 one lump sum on a permit, $80 per tree. Chicago, Chicago residents cannot remove trees on their private property without first getting a tree work permit by the Bureau of Forestry. The Bureau of Forestry issues them only to ISA certified arborists in conjunction with their liability insurance certification. 
And just in case any removal causes damages uh, to the surrounding area private property line, with the introduction of the Emerald Ash Borer to the area recently, and the State of Illinois Department of Ar Agriculture will also want additional compliance agreements settled if the property owner indeed uh, intends to cut down an infected tree, ash tree. Uh, there's also additional work for private property intended to be cut down in an Asian, uh, in any Asian longhorn beetle quarantine area. What that's saying in Illinois, you cannot transport, cannot transport even chips out of a quarantine area. So if you come in, you pay somebody ten thousand dollars to re remove the tree they have to pay an additional fee to take that all your chips from the grinding from your tree to a approved site outside of town that is licensed to handle <coughs> handle that work portland um portland and this by the way is portland oregon not portland indiana i just hit portland i was doing a search ISA certified arborist only. Portland says it's a non-refundable application fee payable to the city of Portland with a base fee of a hundred dollars uh, for up to three trees. Any additional tree is twenty-five dollars per tree, um, and this applies for all trees above a quantity of three. So this is the information that I use. I gleaned to get the permit fee. I didn't use them. Reason being, another reason, I'm old school. When I went to college, it was illegal to pay somebody to do your research paper for you. This is the same to me. I spent, I don't know how many hours, reading all these different uh, cities' ordinances and what they do, how they do it. And I uh, still believe a $50 fee is more than more than easy. Now, the $50 fee came about because I was looking at the city problem of we're losing money, spending money on things that we shouldn't be spending money on. Um, and that's where the section 520, 550-522 article 26 vegetation of chapter 50 fees and fines creating section 102-54 in article 2 trees shrubs and other plants of chapter 102 vegetation of the michigan city municipal code to establish a tree removal permit and fee that's why i came up with this and i proposed which became for everybody else who didn't get a copy exhibit a of why this is the justification for why we needed to do this. And I put in there a city forester, I would like to recommend the establishment of the tree removal permit in the city for the following reasons. The first reason was to work to control contractors Ill illegally performing work within the city, which answers your question and part of your question. Um, two, to verify contractors are properly insured and will work properly to properly prune and remove trees per city ordinance and standards. The properly insured is extremely important uh, in our due diligence. If you as a individual hire a contractor who it, I'm going to say it's an illegal contractor. He comes in and starts cutting your tree. One of his men gets hurt on the job. If he doesn't have workman's compensation, you pay for his workman's compensation. You as an individual, because you hired somebody without workman's comp, you are taking responsibility. And I can tell you when you call your insurance company and tell them, by the way, I hired this guy and the guy's on his property now, who broke his leg, ambulance just picked him up, it's gonna cost several thousand dollars. The insurance company is gonna tell you, 
you're not covered for this because you hired them. So that's part of the process. Uh, assist number three was assist property owners with replacing trees to avoid invasive species. Another program that we're working on diligently is to get rid of invasive species and trees that are not native to the area. Any one of you can go down to Lowe's right now and buy a tree to plant in your yard that's an invasive species or non-native. They don't care. They're out to make a buck. We as a city are looking out for that. Um, Item E was, or excuse me, item D, eliminate unsightly trees and practices that reduce the life of vegetation. The um, life of vegetation and the pruning standards, because we don't use ISA certified arborists, a lot of these guys go in, they improperly prune trees, they leave stubs, they leave things that hurt the tree, reduce its life, and then we later down the road, the city has to go in and replace that tree at our cost. Um, the work to eliminate improper planting and improper tree selection can cause expense to the city in the future, such as root damage, sidewalks, curbs, and streets. This is known as the right tree at the right place. Um, Item F was the submittal of a picture that will work to ensure that removing and replaced trees are properly identified and verification they will be planted on property owned by the resident. Again, another point brought up by the question or concern of cutting down trees or planting trees or doing things on property that's not yours. If, if I have the man who's cutting down the tree or planting the tree coming into my office and getting a permit. And he's supplying me with a picture. He's gonna give me the address of the property and the picture of the tree he wants to remove. Now it's gonna trigger work on our end. We have to go verify that A, yes, that tree is coming out. That property owns that that property owner owns that tree. They're not just worried about removing the neighbor's tree. I get between 20 and 30 calls a day from people saying, hey, I need you to come out, look at this tree. I need this tree removed. I want this tree removed tomorrow. I get out there and look at it, and it's a neighbor's tree. And they say, Well, I don't care. You know, I don't like the tree. It blocks my swimming pool. I want you to remove it. Right now, without this permit the way it's set up and the practice it is and the $50 fee, we're going to continue to have those problems. Mm -hmm. um, another part of this was to avoid illegal dumping of limbs and debris along roadside alleys and properties. Part of this process is as a tree, uh, as a licensed tree person, you have to come and you have to tell me what you plan to do with that tree. Right now, we're spending tens of thousands of dollars a year running around picking up trees from tree companies who cut trees, throw them over the fence, they get paid, they leave, and the city goes back behind and has to pay man hours, equipment, time, and energy, and disposal fee to get rid of this stuff. Um, that what's led into the next part was to avoid the additional cost for the labor to do the cleanup. Again, right now, the city is splitting the bill. They do this every day of the week. Somebody's out there throwing junk over the fence because they can get away with it. There's no accountability to the tree groups. In the event of a storm, information received will assist the city with maintaining proper tree inventory in the GIS system. Right now, we're in the process of doing our tree inventory, citywide tree inventory. Every tree in the city will be GPS located, and they're going to give me a report on how many trees we have, the condition of every tree in the city, the size of every tree in the city, and the canopy of every tree in the city. 
all this information is needed for future work and to, for us to keep our uh, Tree City USA certification and for us to actually know why and what we're doing. Um, incorporating a voluntary requirement. This is uh, Mr. Wolf, if you could, please, could you? I'm just trying to keep it for total transparency for everybody. Oh, we understand. We so got, I'm we, almost done. We, I'm all, almost we, done. we all got copies of what you're saying. You we did, understand. but all the people in the audience did. And that's what I'm doing. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Jay, incorporating a voluntary requirement for assistance by an ISA certified arborist. It's not included as language in this program, in the ordinance, but in the program itself, as I created it, that information is there to add value to the public. Um, they don't know what they're buying, why they're buying, or where they're buying. All they know is this tree's got to come out and they want to put another one in this place. There are certain times of year when you can plant certain species to ensure they're going to grow. You, can, uh, you may have sandy soil and the tree you want to plant grows in the mark. You know, that's where, again, this is a voluntary part of the program where if somebody's going to remove a tree and plant a new one, I'm going to have a conversation with them about what do you see you planting in there? What do you want to buy? And let me give you some tips. So um, I think that answered a lot of the questions that, that I had heard concerns that this is what's incorporated. And again, the request of the council to vote against removal of the $50 fee, I can't understand it. I cannot understand how we, anyone would want to add additional work or continue administration and not have a fee where the people causing the problems aren't paying to correct it. Um, it, it seems like a lose lose. It, the city loses because we're spending money and the entire tax base, the entire population of the city loses because they're paying the bill and taxes for work illegally done when we could have done something to help correct that. And I put it down simply a $50 fee, assuming we only do 100 tree removals next year. I expect that to be higher, but assuming $50 fee is, we're only going to collect $5,000. However, on the back side of that, the thing that's not shown in the dollars, this is not what does it cost, it's what is it worth. The cost is $50. What it's worth over the next years of this $5,000 becomes $10,000 or $15,000 saved by the city because we're not going back and fixing improperly planted trees that are pulling up sidewalks or breaking curbs or coming into the city. So the root damage and uh, future tree replacement is all figured in on the backside. That's not, again, this isn't what does it cost. The cost is 50. What is it worth? Tens of thousands of dollars, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Scott. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Kulavik, 1316 Ohio Street. First of all, we don't need to have more noble fees for any trees. We just were awarded for the U.S. Forestry Service a million dollar grant. We're going to get $200,000 over the next five years to take care of all the trees, so we don't need any fees. I um, want to add a little bit to what Senior Council Emeritus Paul Perez really mentioned about the dead and dying trees. This is uh, Section 102-48 of the Michigan City Code, Public Nuisances. Uh, the following are hereby declared public nuisance under this article in subsection 1. Any dead or dying trees, shrub, or plant as designated by the city forester or designated municipal authority or are located on city-owned property or on private property. They're public nuisances. Uh, you can go actually go on the Google Earth uh, imagery and look all the way back to 2007 before, before these trees were planted. 
A lot of these street trees that were planted in 2012 and, you know, around when our power time, Ron Muir became the mayor. And you can see their various stages, like from 2012 when they were first planted to 2018 to now that they're with a lot of these street trees are now dead. I've emailed several to Mr. Wolf that he needs to re have, have removed. I also want to say if I have a tree on my private property, right now I don't have any trees. I already cut them all down when I moved here. I had three big fat growing maple trees. I, I had them removed. If I'm going to, if I'm going to go do a tax sale, but I know the property, dog, I'm going to have to move. I'm like my grandpa Watson, Arkansas. That man would rather cut the tree down and look at it. Uh, I also want to, want to say, you know, I guess that, that, that that's what I'm going to say. We just need to get all these dead trees. You know, you look at a lot of these videos in Gary. The, the, even the trees look depressed over there. That's what it's starting to look like in Michigan City. So he can go on to any private property and cut down a dead tree. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Any further public comment? Having none, public comment is now closed. Uh, Ms. Nyleb, on the uh, vote for uh, zero payment. Yeah, on the, on the amendments. Mr. On the Mr. amendment. Dabney? So this this is the way the fifty dollar fee or yeah the fifty dollar fee. Nay, Councilman Dabney. Dr. Cora. Nay. Ms. Lee. Nay. Ms. Molinar. Nay. Mr. Nelson. Nay. Mr. Presbolinski. Aye. Ms. Tillman. Nay. Mr. Beatry. <laughs> Aye. And Mr. Coulter. Nay. We have two in favor and seven opposed. One. That was my goal. And Ms. Nyleb? Yeah, we already voted on uh, Dr. Cora's amendment, so that's done. Okay, now we are moving on to our next ordinance on second reading, and that's the amending the uh, fees and fines by title only, Ms. Nyleb? Okay, an ordinance on second reading by title only. Amending the fees and fines with various chapters and sections of Michigan City Municipal Code. And this is introduced by Mr. Dabney and Mr. Beautry. And do the authors have anything they'd like to uh, add at this time? Nothing? Okay. Anyone from the public wish to comment on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to comment? On the ordinance, anyone from the public wish to comment on the ordinance? Having none, uh, any council comments? Any council comments? Having none, this uh, ordinance will be held over for third reading at our next uh, council meeting. And Ms. Nylev, I think we're getting down to uh, ordinances on third reading. And, and our first ordinance on third reading, please. An ordinance on third reading by title only. Ordinance or resolution for appropriation and tax rates. And this is introduced by Ms. Tillman. And do the author, does the author have anything she'd like to add at this time? Um, they are not only only one that this will not be completed until the approval of the third readings for salaries. Okay. Okay. So we could vote on it, but it won't be completed until the third reading of the salaries are done. Okay. All right. Uh, is there any public comment on this ordinance? Any public comment? Any public comment? Having none? Any council comment? Councilman Beatry? On, on my agenda, it's saying we need a formal public hearing on this. We did, did we do that already? It's already held. Yeah. Oh, I did. Is there any further public uh, council comment? Motion to support. Support that. Motion to approve by Councilwoman Tracy Tillman and seconded by Councilman Dabney. Ms. Nyla on the vote. Dr. Cora. Aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Moldenauer. Aye. Mr. Nelson. Aye. Mr. Prezbolinski. Aye. Ms. Tillman. Aye. Mr. Beatry. Aye. Mr. Coulter. Aye. And Mr. Dabney. Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. All right. Thank you, Ms. Nyla. And our next ordinance on third reading by title only. An ordinance on third reading by title only. 
an ordinance setting salaries and wages for appointed officials and employees of the city of Michigan City, Indiana for the calendar year 2025. And this is also introduced by Ms. Chilton. And does the author have anything she'd like to add at this time? I know that we made, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I know that we made, um, voted that no amendments to be done on third reading. However, there is a word um, in this ordinance that needs to just be removed. It does not change the hourly um, rate per hour or the salary. It just needs to be a word removed under the um, administrative assistant th as a part-time and to take that out. Mr. President, if I can comment on that. Sure. Um, I don't view that as a substantive amendment, although procedurally it would still require an amendment. It's just a correction of a Scrivener's error. The numbers don't change. It's just a deletion of a designation of part-time that shouldn't have been there. So can we just delete it and move on? No, you do still need to amend Do I have to it. do an amendment? Yes, but okay. because you voted previously not to make amendments, I don't believe that's what this necessarily is. It's just a correction. Okay, although technically so you have to do it by amendment. It's an amendment to make a correction. Right. Yes. Correct? Yes, it's not okay. substantive though because the numbers are not changing. Okay. So there's been a, uh, a uh, an, an, an amendment presented to make the correction on, what was that word the, again? Under human resource administrative assistance, removing part-time. Oh, okay. Everybody have that? Okay, is there a second on that uh, motion for an amendment? Second. That was seconded by Dr. Cora. Uh, is there any public comment? Yes. To add that, um, uh, Michigan City Animal Control, I just wanted to bring it to the uh, council's attention that with there were supposed to be no raises this year for anybody. And then my union, the Ask Me Union, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, they were no negotiations, but yet the street department CDL holders did perceive negotiation or a pay raise with no negotiation. And so my concern is uh, being fair and equitable, because I called uh, Patanisha at for Human Resources, and she said the only reason one part of my union membership received a raise was because of disparity. She wanted to make everything equal. And so with that being said, animal control officer has received the least amount of increases since 2021. And I have that on these sheets that I could hand them to the council so you could see. You know, I think, I think the best place for this discussion mm -hmm. would be not at this particular time okay okay but during a public comment at the end of the at the end of the council meeting yeah you could come up and explain that to the council okay at the end yeah all yeah. right and we're all we're all we'll be there in 15 minutes so yeah, okay you don't have to go anywhere chad i know you've been sitting here all night but yeah yeah just hang tight okay pardon what Sure. Yeah, Councilman um, Pillman yeah. wants if, to comment on that. If I understand correctly, though, but for animal control and for those other departments, um, CDL is not required for animal control, correct? That is correct. And but, that, but there was no, my union was not negotiating any kind of raise. And so the city basically, with, which is unheard of, they just threw more money. My union was not in a negotiation for a raise, but yet they did perceive a raise. Just to make everything fair and equitable with other CD holders that are non-union components, like refuse drivers. And so with that being said, the disparity for myself would be other code enforcement officers, such as the code enforcement vector control. They have seen substantial increases compared to animal control. I'm a first responder and in a lot of danger. That's why I could present these to you and I have a breakdown of the percentage of increases annually, year to year. 
Okay, if you would provide that um, to the council and to the controller's office as well and, sure. and to the mayor's office. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Do you want to, Chad, okay. under public comment? And then you can address the council. Sure. You, you'll have, uh, you know, three minutes to address the council. So, okay. Three to five minutes. Yeah, something like that. I know that's a that's an issue that you and I talked about on the uh, mm -hmm. on the telephone. Yeah. And so you can bring it up under public comment All instead right. of right now. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that being said, any other public comment on this? Amendment. Scott Mellenter and Kevin Place. I'm a little confused now. Maybe all of us are, or some of us are. We're on third reading, so this has already gone through twice. But it's my understanding that there were no increased salaries essentially in the city this year, other than the one time mid year bonus has gone over. Um, so now I'm, so I'm confused to hear from a member of the public that some people are getting an increase in salary. And to the point of the last gentleman, if you guys vote this ordinance into place that sets the salaries and wages, what purpose would it be for him to later present his evidence of, that he has? It's too late if this is voted up. But I, I, I will comment on it. Just real quickly, uh, Chad had called me. I understood what he was talking about, uh, that they didn't get a raise. He's saying that other departments did get raises. I was told, as all council members were, nobody in Michigan City is getting a raise. So these, I mean, Chad needs to go to the city controller or to the mayor. And, you know, I'll go with them to have a sit down, just explain, and he can explain his case and we'll let it go at that. It's not going to get resolved right here. It's not going to get resolved here. So, but if he wants to explain his case during public comment, he'll have three minutes to do it. But I think there's, so we'll let it go at that. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Then I was just going to add that for this and the next three ordinances that I think is important for the people of Michigan City to understand. That nobody's going to raise this year. We're holding right. the, we're holding the line on, on right. salaries, and I think that's a I think that's uh, an enviable thing uh, for our budget. Thank you. Yeah, Councilwoman Tillman. I'd just like to make a comment um, just to clarify some things. Um, all department heads have the opportunity during their negotiations or conversations with the mayor. And if it was not asked during that time or question, then the budget was presented from the administ administrator as is and was has been accepted. Well, then I then I think so. Every what you said is correct. I mean, there were no raises. Well, then I thank all the department heads for not asking for any increases. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else in the public wish to speak on this amendment? Having none, no, no, we're, we're done. We're done with comments right now on this amendment. We spoke, we're voting on the amendment that Councilwoman Tillman uh, presented. And all we're doing, we're eliminating, we're voting on eliminating the part-time from the Administrative Assistant 3 in Human Resources. Ms. Nylab on the vote. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Moldenauer? Aye. Mr. Nelson? Aye. Mr. Prezblinski? Aye. Ms. Tillman? Aye. Mr. Beatry? Aye. Mr. Coulter? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. And Dr. Cora? Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. Thank you, Ms. Nyla. Uh, our next ordinance on third reading by title only? We have to vote on what you just, just on this ordinance. Oh. On third okay. reading. Ms. Nyla. Back up to the last ordinance. Uh, what we have to do is vote on the ordinance now. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, uh, speaking on the ordinance, anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Having none, any council comments? Having none? Motion to support. 
Yeah, motion to approve by Councilwoman Tracy Tillman. Second, Second by Councilman Cora. Ms. Nyla, one to vote. Ms. Moldenauer. Aye. Mr. Nelson. Aye. Mr. Presbolinski. Aye. Ms. Tillman. Aye. Mr. Beatry. Aye. Mr. Coulter. Aye. Mr. Dabney. Aye. Dr. Cora. Aye. And Ms. Lee. Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. Thank you, Ms. Nyla. Our next ordinance on third reading. An ordinance on third reading by title only. An ordinance setting the annual salary for the mayor. And that's also introduced by Ms. Tillman. And does the author have anything she'd like to add at this time? I do not. not okay. Uh, is there any public comment on this ordinance? Any public comment? Any public comment on this ordinance? Having none, council comment? Motion to support. Motion to approve Second. by Councilwoman Tracy Tillman. Second. And seconded by Dr. Coro. Ms. Nyla want to vote? <clears throat> Mr. Nelson? Aye. Mr. President Bolinsky? Aye. Ms. Tillman? Aye. Mr. Beatrice? Aye. Mr. Coulter? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Dr. Cora? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. And Ms. Moldenow? Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. And thank you, Ms. Nylob. And our next ordinance on third reading by title only? An ordinance? on setting the annual salary for the city clerk. And that's also introduced by Ms. Tillman. And does the author have anything she'd like to add at this time? None at this time, Mr. President. Okay, anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Having none, any council comment? Motion to support. Okay, motion to approve. Second by Dr. Cora. Ms. Nyla want to vote. Mr. Presbolinski? Aye. Ms. Tillman? Aye. Mr. Beatrice? Aye. Mr. Coulter? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Dr. Cora? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Moldenauer? Aye. And Mr. Nelson? Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. And we are done with our. Nope. We got one more. Council. <laughs> okay, why well, just had council members? No, I just did a council. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, here's our final and uh, final and most important ordinance of the evening, setting the salaries for the uh, city council members. So, Ms. Nyla, our final ordinance on third reading by title only. An ordinance on third reading by title only, an ordinance setting the annual salaries for the common council members. And this is also introduced by Ms. Tillman. And does the author have anything she'd like to add? A whole lot now, Mr. Okay. Today. <laughs> Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Is this for the council salary? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is Tom Clough. I do have a bone to pick with all the council members. I give Councilman Beatry a pass on this. He was on the council member. Uh, back then, during your first meeting in January, Mayor Angie asked you to provide your three top goals as a council member. I haven't heard any of your top goals. Teachers, you're late with your homework assignments. Thank you. Does she share it with him? Thank you, sir. Anyone else from the public who wishes to speak on this uh, ordinance? Anyone else from the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance? Having none? <laughs> Council comments? Motion to support. Motion to support by Councilwoman Tracy Tillman. Second. Second by Dr. Cora. Ms. Nyla want to vote. Ms. Tillman? Aye. Mr. Beatrice. Aye. Mr. Coulter? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Dr. Cora? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Moldenauer? Aye. Mr. Nelson? Aye. And Mr. Presbolinski? Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. All right. And that brings us to uh, new business. Is there any new business before the council this evening? Having none, any old unfinished business? Council has uh, two appointments to the revolving loan fund. Uh, incumbents Pia Parrott and Erica Miller 
Uh, their term expires here in three days. Uh, if anybody wants to be a member of the Revolving Loan Committee, one member has to be a senior level, senior level professional loan officer, and one member is from the business or retail who's a resident of Michigan City. All right, comments from the public. Oh, uh, yes, Tommy Kolovic, 1316 Ohio Street. I do have some good news to report. I was listening to the Michigan City Wolves football game on the Alco channel, and Michael Gresham, he uh, reported that uh, Michigan City this March is going to have the good fortune of hosting both the first three rounds of the IHSA Boys Basketball Tournament. Hmm. Uh, we're going to have, I believe, 15 different schools coming here in those in those three weeks. We're going to have the sectionals, the regionals, and the semi-state. As we all know, the IHSA tournament is regarded as the top boys' basketball tournament in the country. It's been that way for, 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 for decades. Uh, during that time, we need to really concentrate on the litter pickup. We know how bad after the snow melts, how bad the litter pick. You know, we want to make a good impression because we want to start having the, especially the semi-state every year. That's a very high level of our tournament here in Indiana. I also want to wish the Michigan City Wolves football team, they're going into their sectional uh, play after this week. They got to host Crown Point, which the Crown Point is a really good team. Uh, they're they're going to, on number first, they're going to travel over to Chesterton. And then they're most likely in the second round going to have to we'll be hosting uh, Valpo again at Ames Field. And I, I think we're going to dispatch a Chesterton. I think we got a good chance of knocking off Valpo. And I think we're going to give Amaroville a good run for their money in the regional. So just want to say keep it up, Wolves, and keep it up, City. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Paul Przblinski, 1716 Washington Street. I uh, want to voice my concerns on some uh, technical issues tonight. Number one, what happened to the three-minute rule? Number two, when you dismiss the council in the middle of a discussion and a vote is against Robert Rules of Orders. Number three, you violated the rules again when you allow, when there is an amendment passed at the last meeting, not to have amendments on third reading, no matter what it says. So I, I think that you need to adhere to the rules. But also, the, from Baker and Tilly, is that what the $15,000 was to increase the fees on, on the departments? to go through the fee structure for the city. I thought it was to get a report for the con controller's office. What's going on with that? Did you guys have any hearings on that? What they did? How can this happen? Twice in what? Two budgets? The one in the, the beginning of the last administration and this administration, and it took them halfway through the year to let the, See, I don't buy that. I don't buy it at all. You were tracing. That, and we're not, poor, and everybody's crying poor mouth, you think you're going to create that much money off of fees? No. You guys need to ask the question. To stop spending money on that 420 acres on the east side on that annexation and have your legal department find out what you can do to have the developers come up to the table and also maybe get a grant like Laporte did from the Commerce Department for $3.5 million out in the Rose uh, Industrial Park for water and uh, sewer out there. But <clears throat> I, I, I'll, I'll tell you that, that you, need to, you need, I don't know how much money you guys even allocated to buy whatever out there for that 420 acres, the biggest boondoggle that ever happened here. And like a gentleman said to me a long time ago, with I which I highly respected and still respect, a gentleman by the name of Stanley J. Prisbolinski Jr. said, the worst thing with Michigan City, everybody walks around with blinders on and poor planning. That should have never happened without the developers kicking in on it. But but I will say that I think it's a shame that we're we're not being able to give uh, people some type of some type of raises. 
and we didn't have another thing I got a problem with you. We didn't have budget hearings this year. We had a workshop. This is that I know of. Could you summarize, please? And oh yeah, I got three pages of questions that I never got to ask at the workshop because I was cut off. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, with the, there was no raises for the city this year. That's inaccurate. I handed out everything to the council members. If you look at uh, street operator, 5% increase, street department driver, 6% increase, vector control assistant officer, 8% increase, and the vector control officer, 5% increase. And these numbers are compared to the 2024 salary ordinance. I just want to make council aware of this. Okay. That's it. So there were raises given this year. Hmm. I just want to revisit it. Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. I'm with, sorry. With the, when, you, when you're saying given this year, you mean within the year of 2020? 2025, yes, 2025. If you approve the 2025 the, salary ordinance. 24, of course, but 2025, everyone received this. The $1,200 is budgeted in this, but it's a one time. It's not increasing no, no. salary, it's just a bonus. If you look at Compare the 2024 mm -hmm. salary ordinance to your 2025 proposed salary ordinance you're going to approve. You will see the the ones I just uh, indicated, street department operator, street department driver, vector control assistant officer, and vector control officer are all going to receive raises. Okay, if, I may, if, if I may, where did yeah. you get these numbers from? Salary ordinances, public record oh, from last okay. year. And yeah, in this year. Okay. Yeah, so I just compared last year's seller ordinance to the ones proposed for this year. Not a question. No, they were approved in 2024. They're accurate. I did my homework. Okay. <laughs> but here's 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 what I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm not gonna suggest. Mm -hmm. Okay. You need to do this. Because I know you're trying to fight to get a raise for your three of the yeah, people I, in your little department. Yeah. Is that you need to get a sit down and have a meeting with the city controller, show her your numbers versus what they have so they can show you exactly. Well, that's what I'm presenting to council what's tonight. Going on. Pardon? That's what I'm presenting tonight. Yeah. And Mary, Mary Lynn sitting right okay. in the back is the city controller. So set up a time when you can go and talk to her. Yeah. Yeah, you can sit down and talk to her All right. in the office and, uh, yeah, go talk to her. All right. And, you know, the city council do the same thing. Uh, you know, come and meet with her and she can show me the numbers and we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to get resolved here tonight. No, right? I know that. But I appreciate I just you wanted to the bring information the council. so we can look into yeah. it. That's what we're here for is, you know, the answer to yeah. Get answers yeah. to the questions that the yes. people have. Appreciate that. All right. All right, Chad. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Okay, Council. I think uh, I think I might be the last one if we're all lucky here. I'd like to point out that uh, according to your own bylaws, three minutes public speaking is the minimum granted, and that it's within the president's purview, I believe, to allow more time. Um, and I think tonight it was warranted to give our very passionate forester the time he needed to make his case. I think we probably all learned quite a lot of why he was proposing the ordinance and the fee. Um, I know I did. Um, we also, the council appropriated or transferred money, $300,000 for the sanitation department for the re necessary repairs of their equipment. We all know their equipment's been being down and heavily used. Um, and, and we all really appreciate the work that the men and women of that department do, uh, sincerely. I've called them unsung heroes in the past. Um, that said, the city does expect a certain level of uh, performance for that. And I think we went over it pretty, pretty, pretty heavily tonight about uh, lawn waste and so forth. But we need to be practical about these things. And I think we all can determine one barrel is not enough. I question the need to bag things to also then put in a plastic thing. If this concern is frost, that's going to be, you know, again, very rare occasions. Um, 
let's not create a situation sort of like when they moved the speed limit to 55 miles an hour that you all of a sudden created a host of lawbreakers by changing the law and now all of a sudden everybody's breaking the law let's let's try to avoid that kind of thing um and the last thing i would say to sum to su for my summation is part of the reason michigan city has been insulated by many fees that other surrounding communities have is in fact because we have the riverboat those funds are supposed to help sort of subsidize us not for operating budget but we have to remember we do in fact get riverboat money still millions of dollars it might be less than we hope for less than has been budgeted in the past but we still get millions of dollars from the riverboat so um let's keep that in mind when it comes to these fines and fees again thank you it was a tough meeting tonight mr president i think you did a great job thank you oh thank you sir i appreciate that uh Good evening, Brian Gross, 830 West 6th Street. Uh, short comments. Heard a lot of stuff tonight about, you know, why one toter, two toter, and all that. And what do property taxes pay for? Well, property taxes pay for normal and usual services in a community. Um, when somebody's using abnormal amounts of services, or excessive services or something, I think they should pay additional fees on that. And I think, uh, you know, as far as the toters and tree permits and all that, I think we need to have fees for things like that to help cover expenses for people that are using more than the average person does. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further public comment? Okay, any council comment? Councilwoman Mullenauer? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring to the attention of the public that um, NIPSCO has a proposed rate hike and that that could increase the um, utility bill anywhere from 14 to $25 per month um, for residents. Um, right now, um, it's an open period for people to send comments to the Indiana Office of Utility Consumer Council, OUCC. Um, you can find them on their website and um, you can submit an email to them. And also um, Representative um, Pat Boy has uh, made an offer. If you have any questions regarding this, you may contact her office and she's available to talk to you or to exchange emails. But um, I want to acknowledge President Don Przybylinski and Sean, um, Councilman Sean Fitzpatrick, who took the lead on this the last time NIPSCO was proposing um, an increase, and they did actually attend the public hearing. So I want to encourage all of our residents and any city council people who are so moved to do that. Um, 14 to $25 per month could be a, a real burden for a number of the people that live in our community. The other thing, my green drinks announcement, um, it's happening on, um, oh good, I forgot to write that down. Um, first Thursday of the month, so that will be um, November 7th, um, 6.30 p.m. Invite you to join the resilience, um, Northwest Indiana Region Resilience will be talking about um, collective environmental plans and actions. A lot of um, our offerings in the community are now under one umbrella, and this is under the Northwest Region Resilience. Kathy Sippel will be there to present on um, the collaborative efforts that are being made and also to hopefully introduce NERPSI's new climate action plan. And then I should have made this announcement during the um, commission space, but I will one of these days catch on. This is very exciting news. Michigan City is going to have its first electric vehicle display drive and information event. This is going to be on Saturday, October 26th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. It will be the last farmer's market. Um, it's going to be held in the GOAT parking lot, which is right across the street from the farmer's market. Um, this is sponsored by the Michigan City Sustainability Commission and Drive Clean Indiana. There will be a 10 a.m. ribbon cutting for the EV electric chargers that are in the GOAT parking lot um, with the Chamber of Commerce. I do want to recognize project partners with the Sustainability Commission, Drive Clean Indiana, 
Michigan City Planning Department, Michigan City Redevelopment Commission, and those chargers were given to us because um, the Sustainability Commission, along with um, Drive Clean Indiana, wrote a grant to get Indiana Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust funds. So come celebrate with us. I think it's gonna be lots of fun. There'll be a lot of freebies handed out. And this is our first of hopefully an annual event that's gonna be happening. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments? Just a couple. Uh, and I know the email went out from our city clerk that the deadline now for handing in console business to the city clerk is noon on Thursday. We moved it back a, a day and give council members, a little, I think, a little bit more time to get the work done. So you got a free day there. And I asked the uh, city controller just so we all knew what the promise, what was in the promise scholarship fund. And there is, I'm just gonna say $2.8 million in the uh, promise scholarship fund. So there's plenty of funding in there, I think. And tomorrow night, uh, yeah, Wednesday night, the 16th, six o'clock, mayor's gonna have a workshop here and they're gonna be talking about the Millennium Plaza Fountain assessment report. So we got that for tomorrow night. And just wanna thank all the council members uh, for participating and paying for the Michigan City Wolves football team dinner last Thursday night down in Squad Post. Uh, it was very well appreciated. I know the team members uh, appreciated very much. Uh, they had chicken, uh macaroni and cheese and some noodle salad and dessert and there were there was even enough for a lot of those uh players to take food home with them so appreciate all the uh council members participating and uh showing up for the ones that did to help serve the uh food and councilwoman lee even got to see some of her old uh a students on there right so uh anyway yeah, that was good. So uh, that's that's good. That's a good thing the city council does is participate in that, you know, and get our name out in the community. Uh, with that being said, is there a motion to adjourn? So I'll move. motion to adjourn. Meeting is now over. Okay.